Welcome everybody. I realize it's very early. It's going to be a long day and I hope as many of you as can will stay for the whole day. I'm Lawrence Weschler, the director of the Inst New York Institute for the Humanities and along with uh, Eric Kleinenberg over here, the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge, we are convening this uh, day of consideration about solitary confinement from various different angles. Um, I thought I'd start just for by showing, telling you something about the picture you see here of the, the toilet from solitary confinement. If you look at it closely, you'll see that it's beaded. And it's the work of the artist Liza Liu, who some of you may know about. She began her career uh, by spending five years beating every surface in a kitchen. Let's turn off that light because it's, uh, block it's knocking that out. Can you see it okay? Spiro, we don't need the, the light on me at this, mo at this point. Uh, but anyway, uh, every surface, the, the water in the sink, the things, and then she went on from there to bead, yeah, that's, there, yeah, that's good. From there she went on to bead a backyard, <laughs> including a million blades of grass. Um, that got her a MacArthur. <laughs> As well it should, I think. No, I'll just show you these again. More recently though, in fact, after she got the MacArthur, she moved to South Africa uh, and began working with uh, uh, Ndebele tribes uh, women who uh, are, have an incredible tradition of, of beading. And they began doing some South Africa specific sorts of works, such as beading prison cages. You can see that's everything there is beaded, including the barbed wire. and uh, prison walk, uh, the sort of places where people are allowed to walk in South African prisons, that's where they get their exercise. Um, here she is working. And then one of her most amazing pieces, it seems to me, was she beaded an entire solitary cell. Um, this was her response to the traditional white cube, you know, gallery setting. This is, you want a white cube, I'll show you a white cube. And it was out of that that she, in fact, it was part of that originally, but then she separated it out that she made this toilet, uh, which, of course, in the tradition of, of modern art, Marcel Duchamp and so forth, is a loaded image. It's also, if you remember her name, Liza Lou, she calls it Lou, so it's a self-portrait. Um, but for our purposes, it's uh, an occasion to uh, think about solitary. Uh, when we began thinking of this, and when I was talking to Eric uh, and, and some of the people in his shop, we were thinking about the way in which there are right now, at this minute, 80,000 people in solitary confinement in the United States. That's probably a low projection. Uh, that is more, that is arguably, it's hard to find statistics for this thing, sort of thing, but that is arguably more people in solitary confinement in the United States today than at any other place at any time in history. Uh, another American exceptionalism to be proud of. But by, by contrast, in Canada, for example, there are 300 people in solitary confinement. And we were trying to figure out how to make this real for people and how to bring people, as I hope will begin to happen during the day, to a conversation about this who are not the usual suspects, who are not the people who go to all the ACLU things and so forth. And it occurred to me that one way to do it would be to invite a range of people, at least during the morning sessions, who've, uh, who are creative people of all sorts, uh, people who work with insects, people who work as uh, scientists, uh, mosaicists, playwrights, uh, monologists, and so forth, um, to talk about a fantasy which I think a lot of us have had at one time or another uh, about what we would do, how we would try to keep from going crazy if we were in solitary confinement. So we're going to do that for the first few hours. Um, 
And we'll start in just a second, but I thought I would tell a story that, about how I first became obsessed with this topic. Many years ago, I was reporting for the New Yorker in Uruguay. Um, there had been a terrible military regime there. There had been a wonderfully kind of zany uh, group of radicals uh, uh, in the period before that called the Tupamaros. Uh, and uh, the military regime crushed this group. You have to remember that Uruguay at that time was the single most democratic place in South America. It was uh, often called the Switzerland of South America. It had a uh, marvelous welfare state, uh, apparatus, social security, all kinds of things. And then in the 60s, uh, the Tupamaros rose up and began doing kind of antic radical things. Um, and eventually, the military cracked down very, very hard. And during the 10 years of military regime in Uruguay, there were more people per capita in prison there than any place in the world. Probably, I imagine, the United States today has a higher rate. But um, in any case, uh, some of the major people, the, the seven top Tupamaros were separated out and subjected to a regime of solitary confinement for over 10 years each scattered among remote military outposts and put in the bottom of wells with grates above them. And I had occasion when I went down to Uruguay to talk with one of them, this marvelous playwright named Mauricio Rosenkopf. And he had been out for about a year at that point, and I asked him how he kept from going crazy during that time. And he said, well, I guess as a playwright, I'm blessed with a vivid imagination. And so as often as possible, I would take long walks to the beach. <laughs> and uh, I would spend the whole day sunning myself, had to watch out not to get a tan uh, sunburn. Uh, one time, it was a huge problem, uh, I forgot to get rid of the Coke bottle on my way back and spent the next 24 hours in an agony uh, of anxiety because I was afraid the guard looking down would notice the Coke bottle. And in fact, I had to sleep on top of the Coke bottle that night. Uh, to, and I woke up with a terribly strained back from having uh, slept on this Coke bottle. Finally, I was able to take another walk to the beach, and I left it there the last time. I never made that mistake again. Uh, then he told a story about, uh, he told me that during the last two years of his incarceration, he had had a very, very uh, intense intellectual relationship with a rooster who had wandered into his thing. And, he told me about the conversations they'd had about Hegel and other subjects. Uh, it was a very smart rooster, he told me. Uh, I asked him whether the rooster had been real, and he said he didn't know. <laughs> anyway, with that as a backdrop, I thought I'd start, we'd start the, uh, today's proceedings by inviting Tony Kushner uh, up to, uh, and you and I can have a conversation. Uh, by the way, we're not giving introductions to anybody. That speeds things up. But also, there are introductions here. You're confused who you are. But Tony Kushner is one of our great playwrights <laughs> and the creator, most recently, of the screenplay for Lincoln. But um, so Tony, I guess my first question to you is, how do you respond to this story about, about Rosenkopf? And whether, I guess the question for you is, in some sense, do you think that as a playwright, it would be easier for you or, or harder to? Uh, you yeah, know, I, I read it when I read a miracle. Can, is this on? Can you hear him? Oh, I didn't turn it on. I was on. Sorry. Okay, is that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that on? Yeah. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I read it, a miracle, the universe, when it came out, whenever that was. Yeah, about 1990 or so. so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I remember that story very vividly, and then you sent it to me when we were talking about coming here. and. It, filled me with the same kind of panic uh, that I, I mean, I would, there was a guy next to Rosenkopf who went completely crazy and kept demanding that the guards bring him water and take him to the bathroom and just uh, be screaming and screaming and screaming and couldn't stop. That would absolutely, without any question, be me. I would not be the person with the rooster. I mean, it's interesting that he says as a playwright, he has a vivid imagination. Um, I don't know that I feel that I have a vivid imagination. I really like talking to people. <laughs> Uh, which is what I think uh, playwriting is really about. It's dialogue. And the idea of being deprived of that 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was incredibly relieved. I had forgotten that detail that they gave him uh, sort of out of date Scientific Americans to look that, at. That was so, another one, yeah, one of the other guys, yeah. And he, I guess, we became he a physicist. Phys physics from reading it to make some sense of it. Um, I, I, I'm enumerate, so I don't know that that would have done me, but at least them with pictures and words to look at. Um, otherwise, it's really something that all my life I've had uh, intense nightmares uh, about. Um, so, I, I, maybe that's why what, what, sort, what sorts of nightmares? Just of being um, buried alive or being stuck in solitary confinement. Um, and every time I've come across, I was asked uh, last year, I decided not to do it, to, to do a screen play f about um, the whole WikiLeaks, uh, Bradley Manning uh, mm -hmm. case. And, and uh, although I have complicated feelings about Bradley Manning and what's his face and uh, Julian Assange and, and the whole thing, I'm not. Uh, an anarchist, and I and I, I think that it's a uh, there's a lot of unexamined nonsense um, from my uh, comrades on the left about WikiLeaks. But uh, uh, and Bradley Manning seems to me to be you know a person of um, who's in many ways in a lot of uh, psychological trouble was before he was arrested, but he's been in solitary confinement. Let's for, keep that in mind through this whole day to day. That if you want a face for the eighty thousand people. We'll have a few here later on, but Bradley Manning is one of those people who has been in solitary confinement the whole time. Right. And, and entered exactly psychologically troubled to begin with. Right. And, is, and it's clearly in some sense a form of torture mm -hmm. and, and really disturbingly um, <clears throat> not even torture for any, you know, ostensible, I mean, not that torture is good if you have a purpose, but mm -hmm. there's really nothing that Bradley Manning at this point can be expected to tell anyone. He, yeah. he, he acted very much on his own. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's a kind of a creepy feeling of just um, abusiveness. I don't know if he's still in solitary. Uh, uh, as of the time that I was doing research, he absolutely yeah. uh, was in and out, is. but was. And even though he was a person who it seemed to me had issues, he's apparently displayed this, co this uh, Rosenkopf's level of uh, durability and, mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, strength. Mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, Psychic structures have, according to people who have talked to him, kind of remained intact. Hmm. But it would be easy to imagine how that would just come. Completely it's striking uh, when you say. I mean, one, two things that have just come out is, is I, I. My fantasy is that the playwright sits in a cube by himself, and generates dialogues and so forth. And and, but of course, one of the things you just pointed out is that in your case, and I think that's probably true of other playwrights, that in between the time that they sit in things by themselves, they go out and they talk to people. They try. Cadence is out on people. Well, you're going to rehearsal. I mean, you know, with honor sitting there. I mean, poets, uh, you know, I mean, I admire them immensely. I think uh -huh. poetry is the greatest uh, kind of writing, but I, I could never do it. Um, I, I, I need to be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a difficulty facing playwrights because you then have to leave the rehearsal room. My friend George Wolf says, you know, it's time to leave the party and go back into your solitary again, you know, but it's obviously not all that uh, difficult kind of solitary, but it's, you have to, the trick of it is uh, to remain, I think, uh, developing as a, as a playwright is to be able to um, plunge into the incredibly gregarious world of rehearsals and, you know, actors mm -hmm. are just the best people in the world to hang around with. They're the most fun, I wouldn't marry one, but they're the most fun people <laughs> on earth to, uh, to be around and, and, uh, and then you have to go uh, back and be alone, and so it's it's writing, and it's not. It, it occurs to me also that in a way, it's like the dilemma of exiles who, when they are forced out of their native language, uh, yeah. and the daily contact with their native language, which is to say, the contact with other people, that it withers and it can be extremely dangerous. Yeah, uh, although I, I think that we actually playwrights don't have a native language. I mean, we're we're, we're amphibians. Uh, we're we're writers and not writers at the same time, and mm -hmm. it's, that's what I love about about doing it. It's a very peculiar uh, um, art form mm -hmm. uh, in that regard because you never settle uh, comfortably anywhere, um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, kind of a joy of it. So. so, talk a little bit more though about the anxiety of. Well, obviously, the anxiety of being buried alive, but the but but the anxiety of being by yourself. You know, I I think it's probably connected in some way to, uh, or rather, the the fear that I have about writing is probably connected to this. But the, you know, there's a there's a, a way in which you're, uh, I would imagine, 
uh, you're forced into a direct confrontation with yourself with no possible distraction and with no assistance from interaction with other people. And it's a profoundly unnatural uh, thing for any human being to be in complete isolation because we, 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 there's no such thing as a single human being. There's no such thing as an individual in one sense. We're so deeply connected. Um, so it's, you know, it's profoundly moving the story of the rooster. I don't think that you said in the book that the rooster uh, and he talked about Hegel. Yeah, I was saying. Uh, you know, I think what you said in the book is just that there was a rooster that showed up at some point and he didn't know, which I found, uh, you know, uh, and I imagine at some point you sort of stop uh, caring. I, I think that it's the, I mean, any uh, idea of being, um, when I've done, uh, you know, civil disobedience kind of things and getting arrested, it's always scary when you, um, are in, a, uh, in the clutches of somebody else and you realize that you really actually have been deprived of any kind of agency. I mean, you really, mm -hmm. and you know, I've never been in jail for more than like a day. And, uh, but I've, I've always found the idea of, um, of, of, a, of a long time um, forced to be alone uh, really, really um, Terrifying because I think it would test something that I'm not confident um, would withstand the. Um, I had a, uh, well, Daniel Boyarin, who's a, a, a sort of um, he he runs the Talmudic Studies Department at UC Berkeley, and he's this wonderful. He's a, he's a rabbi, and when he was in the IDF in the Israeli Army, he um, had to man an outpost in the desert. Um, uh, where he would have to stand with a gun and stare out into the darkness in the desert for eight hours. And, and you, his job was to stand there and stare out and not do anything else. So he started bringing books with him and he would read and he got caught several times and um, they were threatening a court martial and put him in, in jail and he had to get a psychiatrist to uh, uh, write a, a report saying that, that he had a mental illness uh, that if he didn't have a book to read, he would go crazy, and that sort of guy gave him a, a, a medical exemption from being on guard duty. But I talked to him about it, and he said that it was just, it was, he really tried, but being without a book, um, just staring at the black, and that was, uh, stayed with me as a kind of a vivid image of, um, we, when, we, when we were first talking about this, I mentioned, uh, when I, uh, years ago, got very interested, in, and I still am interested in American anarchism as a, as a radical left tradition, um, and, I, and I read uh, The Prison Diaries of Alexander Berkman, who was Emma Goldman's lover, and uh, a man who, um, uh, after the, this incredibly um, vicious assault on striking workers, decided to assassinate Henry Clay Frick and um, attacked him in his mansion. Um, with a knife, and because Berkman wasn't really a violent man, it wasn't very big either, he managed to stab Frick a couple of times in the leg and was put in Leavenworth prison for 17 years. Uh, um, I think it may have been a life sentence originally, but he finally got out after 17 years. But he spent, I don't remember how many uh, years, I think the first four or five, um, intermittently in solitary confinement. and. Uh, begged uh, Emma Goldman, and, and he got letters to her somehow through his lawyers, I think, uh, to come to Kansas with um, cyanide capsules that she would smuggle in, and, and if he was allowed to meet with her, uh, he, he would, they would find a way to uh, trade them, and that he could kill himself because he couldn't, he couldn't stand it. Um, she two times, I think, took the train from New York to Kansas with the cyanide, and, and once made it all the way to Leavenworth, to the city near Leavenworth and, and uh, Kansas City and checked into a hotel, but both times turned around and came back and she couldn't do it. She was no better with the Sinai than he was with she, the knife. She couldn't, she couldn't, uh, yeah. she loved him and she couldn't do it. And then Voltarine de Clare, who was this uh, sort of some, somewhat forgotten figure, but who was an incredibly great, um, she was a, an anarchist writer and kind of the, the Dionysian uh, anarchist, as opposed to the Apollin, you know, to Emma Goldman's kind of you know positive uh, revolutionary spirit. Voltarine is this very, very uh, dark and but just an astonishing writer, and uh, and was also in love with Berkman, who was very hot. And uh, uh, Voltarine said, um, "I'll do it," and she went all the way in and got into the room with Berkman, and then couldn't give them to him. Um, 
one of the, I mean, this has nothing to do with solitary confinement, but uh, in fact, it's the opposite. In yeah. the in yeah. the diaries, he writes yeah. very openly about the uh, terrible stress on his soul, on his psyche of being in in solitary. And then one of the things that makes this, the diary so extraordinary is that he writes about um, a physical relationship, a sexual relationship he had when he was let out of solitary with another prisoner. And, and even though he was heterosexual and was with Emma before he went into prison, and then when he got out, they had moved, uh, they stayed friends, but he mm -hmm. picked up with another woman. Um, uh, but he writes, and this thing was published, I think, in the 19, early 1920s, and he writes very openly and says if it hadn't been for this man, and not only for our friendship, but for the physical act mm -hmm. of love, that we, I would not have survived um, prison. I, I know I would have found some way to, mm. to kill myself. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, he was really one of the great It sounds like something people. that's percolating for a play. Well, I mean, the other thing that we talked about, I, I, um, I, I bought this thing. Uh, the last play that I wrote, The mm -hmm. Intelligent Homosexual's right. Guide to Capitalism and Socialism with the Key to the Scriptures, which was at the Public Theater last uh, May, um, the main character is a, a fictional um, relative of uh, Vito Marcantonio, the six-time radical congressman from East Harlem uh, who died of a heart attack in the 50s. And um, uh, this guy is a made-up uh, cousin of his. Uh, who lives in a brownstone in Brooklyn and is a longshoreman uh, who uh, won the guaranteed annual income uh, in a uh, dock workers' strike in the early 70s. So he hasn't actually worked as a longshoreman uh, and he's now retired from not working. Um, and in the immense amount of free time that he's had collecting the guaranteed income uh, that they won in the strike, he's taught himself Latin and uh, has been translating the epistles of Horace. Uh, and, and the play is about his decision. Um, he had attempted suicide uh, at 71, the year before the play begins, and then at 72, um, he calls his three adult children back to the family brownstone. It's something that, they're, uh, that his grandfather, a stevedore from uh, Italy, managed somehow to scrape up enough money to buy. Um, uh, he calls them back to tell them that he's decided that he's gonna do it and he's worked out how to do it this time. He had tried cutting his wrists before. Um, and, and you know, this is a, I translated with what I remember from high school Latin, um, uh, Horace's epistle. Um, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's a, um, a epistle 16 from the first book of, uh, of Horace's epistles. And it, it's like most of them, it goes all over the place. There are themes that tie various uh, things together. It's an astonishing, I mean, everything that Horace did was. Um, and uh, after talking a lot about, uh, about rich people and poor people and um, making some very salient points about um, the problem about being rich and, and how it undoes you, uh, at the end of the, of the epistle, um, he says, uh, Horace writes, uh, the good man, the wise man is brave enough to say, as the disguised God said in Euripides' play, the Bacchae, which is actually not in Horace. I added that line because I think that's what he's talking about. Uh, Penthe is king of Thebes. Again, in Horace, it's, he's not identified. Uh, what terrible things can you uh, do to me? Because uh, uh, the disguised God is Dionysus and he's in Pentheus' prison. And uh, Penthe says, I'll take everything you have uh, my cattle, you mean? My farm, my possessions, and bank account? Take them. And Penthe says, and I'll shackle you hand and foot and hand you over to a sadistic jailer. And then uh, the, this prisoner replies, God will free me as soon as I ask him to. Um, you know, and in the Bacchae, of course, that's what Dionysus said, but he is God. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he's decided that he's had enough of these games with Penthe, the prison just completely collapses and vines sprout out of the rock. You know, but um, what Horace writes is, God will free me as soon as I ask him to. What the character's saying is, I'll die. That's my understanding. And then it's great. The last line is always death. I don't, that may be cheating. In, in the uh, Latin, it's um, uh, uh, opinor hoc sentit moriar, I can die. Uh, Mors ultima linea rerum est. 
so it actually is the last line is death. I don't know if in ancient Rome a line meant a line in a play, but I thought that was a kind of wow. it was a kind of good fun. And, and uh, this is a man who um, he's he's a, a, a longshoreman. He's also been a member of the Communist Party. He's a, from a family of Italian radicals. And his great his grandfather was an anarchist. His father was a communist. He's a communist. Um, and he was an organizer for the, for the party um, all his life. And he left the party uh, after the, Cle the, the Cleveland Convention in the early 90s and the collapse of Gus Hall and all that stuff, and then came back. He rejoined after 9-11. It's, of it's an ideology and a home for him. But it's also become a prison for him. He, he, uh, he feels um, completely isolated. And I know a number of old communists who feel this way, I mean, real, really bewildered and, and abandoned by mm. history and mm. by the world. And he's learned this dead language that nobody can speak anymore. Um, uh, and, and ultimately is, is choosing to die. I mean, he says to his, uh, his daughter, um, when he finally sits down and explains, the first thing that he says is that I, you know, when he was young and, and, and reading Marx, he could, he could see the world as this uh, extraordinary uh, web of systems and interconnections and, and could understand that if you just readjusted things slightly, you could upset a balance that had been put into place with great violence and a new kind of violent force could be released mm -hmm. in the readjusting, which could change the configuration in the direction of you know, justice and the possibility of life for most people as opposed for only a very few. And, uh, and that, that that has slowly died out and, and that he feels this, this terrible isolation, uh, but that he knows he has a, a, a means of, of, in a sense, he has affecting his own as a, re as a revolutionary action, as a way of, of, of refusing imprisonment, as a way of, you know, and if you can't change the world outside, you change the world inside. And so I got very interested in, in communists who committed suicide, There's a, or, and also Louis Althusser who committed murder, in, you know, uh, but the, the connection between issues of revolution and, and self-destruction yeah. and this feeling of isolation. So. I, want you, I know you have to leave in a minute, but I want you to stay there because I want you to hear the poem that Alistair is going to read, and then I'll have a question for you. But Alistair, uh, yeah. can you come and, and, and join us? This is Alistair Reed. Uh, apart from anything else, he's one of the, the foremost translators of Borges. Well, we're and, not going to. Can you, can you do it here? Is that OK? You have the poem here. I have, I have it here for you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, would you rather sit down? No, I, well, uh, you were, you were talking. No, you know, talking. OK, well, OK. But while they mic Alistair up, this is a poem uh, by, well, Alistair will describe it. But he, he and a Mexican poet got together and uh, chose 50 poems each of English and Spanish uh, and then translated them together for, I believe, two months in Guadalajara. And you get everything wrong. Oh, well, right? well, there you go. That's it was one <laughs> month in, in uh, Cuernavaca. 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 See, one month, that's what I said. Well, <laughs> Alistair, you of all people. <laughs> but anyway, um, so he's, we've handed out this poem. And let, we need one up here. I want to show uh, Tony as well. Uh, so, so since I get it wrong, you explain it. Well, I'd, I'd like to say a little thing first about solitude. Seeing the word solitary in huge letters terrifies me all the time because we're used to dealing with living in time. And, uh, and solitary means the absence of time. I first uh, found this uh, during the war. I served in the, in the British Navy in, in the Far East and uh, stationed in in Ceylon, as it was called then. And we used to put to sea in a very small boat, a frigate with about 70 
of a ship's company with no orders at all we were sent to sea. We were never told where we were going or, or for how long and we would put to sea for something like 30 days without having any, there was no time. We were suspended at sea and I found it one of the most frightening times, never having anything in view. And this is the real meaning of solitary, to be deprived of time, to be deprived of any expectation. And uh, as a matter of fact, after when the war ended, we were sent to the Persian Gulf to continue this thing and someone was inspired enough to give the ship a uh, movie projector which came on board with only one film and it was National Velvet. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor's greatest role <laughs> but she was in love with a horse <laughs> and uh, we showed it and showed it again and again and again and again, and when we'd all seen it at least 26 times and knew the dialogue by heart, then the electrician who showed it showed it backwards. <laughs> and believe me, it began with Elizabeth Taylor riding in the Grand National, winning, being given a cup, and then getting up on a horse awkwardly and running over fence after fence backwards, <laughs> joined every, at everyone by more and more horses. <laughs> and it ended with Mickey Rooney walking backwards down a long road, getting smaller and smaller <laughs> and disappearing. <laughs> and this did very little for our solitude, believe me. <laughs> and uh, th this, uh, business has continued all the time. The terror of being deprived even of time. And uh, although we complain as writers always about time, which is the main subject of being a writer, I think dealing with time, to have time taken away from you is to be left completely in isolation. And this is where the imagination comes into play. Then uh, the only, the real equivalent, I've never experienced solitary confinement, but I have done a great deal of solitary translation, which is very close to this experience of solitary confinement. To be alone with a, with a text in another language and a dictionary as the only company you have, and to wrestle with a poem in one language, trying to bring it up to snuff in another language. However, there are compensations, <laughs> and one of the compensations, one of the few compensations, is the poem that Wren has asked me to read. It's by a Mexican poet called Juan Carvajal, very whimsical poet who's unfortunately died 12 or 15 years ago. The poem is called A Thousand and One Nights and uh, I will read it to you. Pura and I each did these translations together in Cuernavaca. She knows English very well and we had very amusing conversations about the poems as we were translating them. And here is the poem, The Thousand and One Nights. I told the genie of the lamp, I have only one wish for now. I would like, before dying, to see the aurora borealis and hear the music that precedes its coming. Sorry, I'm going to read it off the print, which is clearer. I told the genie of the lamp, I have just one wish for now. I would like before dying 
to see the aurora borealis and hear the music that pre precedes its coming. Gallop with the Tartars across the infinite plains of Mongolia. Be shipwrecked for nights and days, lashed to a flimsy plank. Wake up in a forest full of water nymphs. Be a camel driver in Isfahan and a prince in Istanbul, both in the same day. Spend the entire night lost in the Congo and find a magic plant. Cross the Gobi Desert alone and map it precisely. Be a schoolmaster in a hamlet in Siberia. Travel with my favorite whale, either inside or outside. <laughs> Be a man condemned to death against the wall or in the chair. Be the Pope in Rome by day and a whore in Singapore at night. Feast on a missionary with my tribe in Zimbabwe. Be the richest man in the world and the most depraved. Live like a Khandala in Bombay. Be a black poet burning on the crosses of the Ku Klux Klan. Be the grand master of the crime. Live in a lover's colony on a coral island. Paint a masterwork about nothing at all. Have a harem with Kim Basinger grossly deformed. <laughs> Be the mother of 20 illegitimate sons. Live in as, as an ascetic in the Sinai and discover there is no God. Own a palace of marble and live in a hovel. See Earth from another galaxy. Do lascivious things to delight an inflexible queen. Be a boy with a kite on the slope of the Andes. Be offensive to God and know that he felt terrible. <laughs> Comfort him and make up both of us happy. Be a benevolent tyrant in a most fertile kingdom. Be a trapeze artist and recite poems in the air. Call myself Achaverus. Be a cobra with its dark wisdom, its poison. Meet myself in the street and follow me See me as the one who hates me sees me, as she who loves me sees me at the peak of love. Converse with Plato in his gardens. Make love on a chestnut horse at full gallop. Invent an unimaginable shocking flower at bird. Feel what that man was feeling that night in Gethsemane. Know all the seaboard, seaports of the world, tell them by smell. Marry the most beautiful woman in the planet and be extremely poor together. Be a salamander and live in the fire. Later, I'll tell you my other two wishes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alfie. So, that's an alternate way of spending time. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It, it, it reminds me, you've got to get going, but, but, but uh, your, your story about the, the rabbi on uh, guard duty, and this for that matter as well, reminds me of a great poem of, of uh, Thomas Tranströmer's called Guard Duty where he was, that he talked, it's a great poem, I don't have it with me, but, but, but he talks about being on guard duty and, and it, on the Finnish board because he's, everybody's drafted in Sweden and they have to do guard duty, like, for what, you know? But at one point it says, task to be where I am, even in this solemn and absurd role, I am still the place where creation does a little work on itself. Mm. That's beautiful. But anyway. Well, listen, you've got to get going, but thank you so much for sure, coming. Sure, my pleasure. I wish I could stay for the whole day. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Anyway. thank you. Uh, and Alistair, again, thank you. That was just terrific. Uh, Joshua, are you around? Yeah. Uh, I'll turn this, put this down. Uh, Joshua Four will give us another, uh, he's going to get mic'd up. Uh, Sorry? 
Oh, sure. I asked Joshua here because, as you know, he at one point was the U.S. memory sure. champion sure. 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 and trained himself uh, as his book outside uh, Hi. details. He, tr he trained himself in, in, um, in sure. some of the great, great memory traditions. We, maybe that would be something you could do in solitary. But give yeah. us your thoughts. Thank you. Um, uh, no, I'm not. So in it uh, no, no, it's a, a it was written like oh, the there's somebody he, he's oh, he's we gotta get his thing. Okay. It's the first play written in English. That the voice Tony of God. Still on. I thought you might. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, so it was Kushner. It was the voice of God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you. <laughs> uh, at some point in I think it was either late 2006 or early 2007. I don't actually remember exactly when. Uh, I had the privilege of spending a day with a woman who is known in the medical literature as AJ. And she was the first person ever diagnosed with uh, this newly identified condition called hyperthymestic syndrome, superior autobiographical memory. She could remember something, not everything, but at least one thing, that occurred on every day of her life since childhood. Now, human memory is not supposed to work like this. <laughs> right? Most of us forget most of our lives as fast as we lead them. And the question for neuroscientists was, how do we explain this extraordinary woman? How do we explain her extraordinary memory? And what is the difference between her and the rest of us? Or is there one? So, until relatively recently, most psychologists actually believed that uh, we hold in our minds, in our memories, a perfect recording of everything that's ever happened to us. Every smell we encounter, every feeling, every touch, every word we utter gets stored away in, a, uh, in our cerebral attic. And if we can't find those memories, it's uh, simply because we've, we've lost the key to the filing cabinet, not because those memories have actually been erased. And this misguided belief, which I don't think most psychologists now uh, subscribe to, basically goes back to an experiment that was conducted, um, a set of experiments from the 1930s to the 1950s, by a Canadian neurosurgeon named William, um, no, Will, uh, Wilder Penfield, sorry. And he was operating on epileptic patients, trying to uh, identify the source of their epilepsy. He had their skulls open on the operating table while they were still awake. And he would touch different parts of their brain with an electrical probe. And he found that when he would touch uh, areas of the temporal lobe in particular, he would elicit what seemed like long forgotten memories. You know, people talking about uh, trading desserts during lunchtime in second grade, that sort of thing. And when he would touch that same part of the brain, he would get the same, the same memory elicited. And so people came to believe that perhaps he was you know, accessing these long forgotten memories. Uh, in the 1980s, the early 1980s, a Dutch psychiatrist uh, named Willem Wagner uh, conducted a kind of incredible experiment. He spent six years trying to record in detail uh, his entire life. So every day, at the end of the day, he'd take a set of index cards and write down every salient thing that had happened to him on that day, uh, who he had been with, where he had been, what, what exactly had transpired. And at the end of those six years, um, he went back and wanted to see how much of his life he had, in fact, remembered. And what he found was that of the more recent events, he remembered just about everything. And as he went farther back in time, um, he remembered less and less. And of those events that happened in the first year of the experiment, he remembered about 80%. But here's what's really amazing. He took uh, the index cards from the events that he couldn't remember, and he went back to the people who were listed on those cards as having been present at those events. And he said to them, help me out. Give me something that you remember from that event, and let's see if it cues my memory. And he found that, in fact, with the right set of cues, he was able to remember every single event that had happened to him on those cards. Now, we don't know how much of our lives we are actually capable of remembering. Nobody's ever performed that experiment of trying to recall their entire lives. Nobody's ever performed the experiment, because if you were going to do it, if you were going to try and remember everything that had happened from your first memory to the present moment, it would consume the rest of your life from the present moment onward. It's an experiment nobody could ever possibly conduct, um, unless perhaps 
you found yourself uh, confined to solitary confinement in that condition. And so I think that's what I would spend my time in solitary confinement doing, trying to figure out exactly how much of my life I could remember. And I thought about how I might do this. And what I think I would do is I'd start with a, a set of index cards, like that Dutch psychologist, and simply try and spill out as many memories as I could. Probably have to empty out an entire staples to have enough uh, index cards. And I think over time, that process would stop bearing fruit. And so I would move on to stage two. Now, we know that our memories are associational by nature, that we can go from the Milky Way to milk to white to berry white. That's a short neurological jump. And so what I would do is I'd start taking the index cards of the things that I had remembered, and I'd start using them to cue myself. OK, here's my memory of my um, fifth birthday party at Putt-Putt in Rockville, Maryland. And I remember that Chloe Thompson was there. And I remember now that in fifth grade, I kissed Chloe Thompson in a game of spin the bottle. And that was at Nick Sadowski's house. And Nick Sadowski ended up going to the um, Naval Academy. And now I remember a trip to Annapolis and so on and so forth. And I think I could spend a few more years using that process to help dredge up more memories, throwing these, these fishing hooks into my memory and seeing what I can pull back out. And I think eventually I would exhaust that process. And I'd move on to step three, when I would start asking the guard on the other side of the door for random words. Bourbon, sunglasses, necktie. And I'd start using those to, to go fishing again. And I think I'd end up with this big stack of index cards. And I'd probably like to start then keeping, putting them in, in um, chronological order and overlaying the structure of the calendar on top of them and seeing if maybe I can fill in every day of my life. It's a kind of quixotic dream. Um, now, turns out AJ, after she came to light, uh, we discovered about two dozen other people who had this extraordinary condition, hyperthymestic syndrome. And when scientists went and sort of started looking at what these people all had in common, they found basically one thing, one trait that they all shared. And that is, they all had, to some degree or another, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I saw this very clearly when I got a chance to spend time with AJ. It turns out she is an obsessive diarist. She uh, writes in the tiniest little handwriting on a calendar everything that happened to her every day. She, um, she goes online. She prints out the weather every morning and then files them away, uh, those printouts in, in, in binders that, that line, her, line her house. And every morning when she wakes up, when she's blow drying her hair, she thinks back on what she did on that day a year ago, on what she did on that day two years ago, on that day three years ago, four years ago. She's constantly revising her life in her memory. And what this suggests is that perhaps what's extraordinary about this woman is not her memory, but rather this compulsion to remember. And I think if I were to find myself in solitary confinement, I suspect it would confirm the old truism that the only life we live is the life that we remember. And if that's true, then that raises a question. Uh, I mean, of all the things that you could be obsessive about trying to hold on to, trying to remember your own life is maybe not the craziest thing. And perhaps it's not AJ who is mad, but the rest of us. Thank you. <laughs> Stay there. Go over there. <laughs> keep, keep that. Okay, you go. Oh. Oh, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to him for a few seconds. Okay. Of course, uh, one of the problems with being in solitary is they don't give you index cards. Oh, that kind of solitary. Shoot. <laughs> um. Um, and I also wonder to what extent what you're talking about, I mean, I, I, this obviously gets, your book is all about this, but is what, whether you're remembering your life or you're remembering what you remember remembering or whether you. Uh, sure, I'm sure. <clears throat> I mean, we, we know that I would be filling those index cards with false memories mm -hmm. because, <clears throat> uh, you know, every time we reactivate a memory, we don't just, you know, dredge it up, pull it out of a, 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 a safety deposit box and look at it and then put it back in. We, we pull it back up in the light of who we are at that moment. 
and who we are at that moment when we're recalling that memory is different. It's the Guadalajara Cuernavaca problem. We, we had that, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're, yeah. we're different right. than we were at the, the last time we recalled that memory. And the memory takes on a new inflection uh, based on, on who we are at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so we're changing. Our, our memories are constantly mutating as we ourselves are constantly mutating. Mm. I was, it's interesting because I was thinking that, that, that uh, something that you might do if you were in solitary would be uh, memory exercises or something. Yeah, I already did that, though. I wrote a book about right, right, right. it. I <laughs> so, moved on. OK, but, but, but describe what that might be like. Again, if you were, if you were, if you were it's not, mm. it won't be you. You aren't the person who's written that book. Mm -hmm. but, but, but is that a thing that you could do to try? Again, you're trying to keep from going crazy. Right. Although, have, frankly, well, when, what, you were, when you were doing that, I think you were going crazy, actually. But, 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 yeah, uh, well, but, I mean, so it's funny. The, the, um, the guy who is kind of the main character of my book um, and who was my, my coach mm -hmm. took me under, under his wings and taught me all these ancient memory tricks. Um, he said that to me at one point that his measure of, um, well, that he would like to be the kind of person who could spend 10 years in solitary confinement, those were his actual words, um, without going crazy because he has stocked away so much good stuff in his memory, so many poems, so many great stories, that he could sit there with his eyes closed and reread the Iliad, which he had, in fact, memorized, or Paradise Lost, which he had, in fact, memorized. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd have to kind of, he was pre he's spending his whole life prepping for solitary confinement. and. Uh, you know, I, I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's keep going. Uh, could you, in a white room, kind of do tricks to, to memory gymnastics, you know, set yourself challenges? Uh, yeah, but what would your input be? What would you be memorizing? Well, that's the question. So what could you do? In, in a, again, I'm trying to push you on, on right. this fantasy. You just got arrested. Yeah. And there you are, you of all people. Uh huh. Huh. Who do have these techniques? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose we could ask the uh, ask the whisper to the guard, and ask him for for things to to remember and, and commit those to memory. Um, but I mean, again, or you could whisper to yourself. I mean, you could. I you suppose could, that's true. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, what I was doing, what I was talking about doing just now, right. is a kind of retrospective uh, memory, as opposed to what I right, think you're right, asking right, me. Right. 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 Which is, could you try to remember Hamlet's soliloquy? And struggle piece by piece, uh, assuming that at some point you've read it, right? To be Probably or not to be, times. and so forth. Yeah. Would the, would your mm -hmm. memory tricks be able to help you dredge it out of your head, or, or I not? I don't think so. I think it's gone. That's, that's actually my honest belief. I think I've forgotten most of what I. Penfield could school. not push push little buttons in your head and make. Well, you what know? Penfield was actually a listening was more like hallucinations uh, than than authentic huh. memories. Um, that, that, I think, is what we would now say. More like, something more like deja vu uh -huh. than, um, than actual long lost memories. Huh. So wow. I'm skeptical that I'd be able to pull back uh -huh. Hamlet. Sorry to disappoint. No, no, well, <laughs> listen, we have a few minutes here before we uh, start the next session. We can have questions from the audience and also for Alistair over there. But yeah, go ahead. Loud. Art of memory on it, you would have had to memorize it right. you know, in the first place. I right. Would, you know, would, right? That's what I was. That's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You'd have, you'd have to have prepped. So that, that's interesting. So, so that in other words, what you're saying about the memory is that even though you've read it twice and it is there somewhere, but when you say it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Well, we now know that forgetting is an actual. Uh, I mean, that's something that happens at the cellular level in the brain. Right. Um, like forgetting is real. Right. It's not simply the case that we, we, we've lost access to the, to the filing cabinet. Some of the files have actually disappeared. And thank God they have, otherwise there wouldn't be room for anything else. Otherwise we would be, we would be crazy, which uh, is one interpretation of, of AJ's condition. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, there's pr really good reasons why we forget and mm -hmm. why we don't remember everything that happens yeah. to us. Other things, let's see, yeah, but loud. Would your memory techniques or just trying to remember everything not prevent you from living the now? I think it would, but I'm not sure what the now would be if you were in solitary confinement. No, I'm just not just curious about your book and your research. I 
what would the purpose be of trying to remember the things that are happening to you? Well, if you were talking, um, I mean, I think there's a, a great argument to be made for trying to remember things that are happening to you right now. And that re requires, um, I mean, OK. So the main reason we don't remember things is because we're not paying attention. And um, I think that uh, if, you can, if you can keep that thought in mind, that I'm going to be the kind of person who is constantly reminding myself to remember, remembering to remember, uh, that's a good way to move through the world, and it's a good way to have a more memorable life, but also to be more present. Hmm. And that in itself, talking about presence in solitary, that would be a, a conundrum right there. How do you how do you how do you remember what's happening day to day when nothing's happening day to day? Yeah, so you know, actually, I, I, I should have spoken about this instead. I, I, I had an opportunity to interview a guy named Michel Siff, who is a French chronobiologist, a guy who studies the, um, the science of, 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 of time and its effect on, on organisms. And he conducted one of the most extraordinary self-experiments in the history of science. He had himself lowered into a cave. Uh, he did this, actually, on a several occasions. He had himself lowered into a cave for, I think it was like six months, without access to light, no access to a calendar, no watch. And he wanted to know what this would do to, um, to his sense of time. And what happened, what he found very quickly, was that his memory was the first thing to go. Without the day to structure his life, it became impossible to remember what had happened a day ago what had happened a month ago. He also found that his sense of time's passage had uh, dramatically changed. So there was some date when he was supposed to, uh, when he was called, called down from the surface, experiments up, time to come up, time to come upstairs. Uh, he had been keeping a diary. And what he found when he went up to, um, to ground level was he had thought it was, you know, whatever, August 12th. In fact, it was um, October. 18th. His sense of time's passing had uh, collapsed mm. by, uh, by a dramatic factor. Mm. Um, and I think that is something that would happen to anybody in solitary confinement without, mm. without all that input. Right? We, it is our memories that structure our, our experience of time's passage. And the more of those uh, landmarks, the more of those chronological landmarks we're able to, to have in our life, uh, the more uh, the more slowly time seems to pass. And that is a pretty um, good case for not living the kind of life that is day to day uh, exactly the same thing happening to you over and over again. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in a cubicle. You're doing the same thing. Every you should be taking vacations. You should be going and doing exciting things and having new experiences, not just because those are worthwhile things to do, but because um, the more you can pack your life with those kinds of chronological landmarks that we use to reference ourselves in relation, in, in, in relation to the passage of time, uh, the longer our lives will actually subjectively feel. I mean, it's interesting that uh, we talk about wasting our lives, but it's worth, in this context, saying that, that as a body politic, we are laying waste to the lives of 80,000 people right now. Yeah. And, uh, and and we are actively wasting them, and and, uh, and something to think about whether we want to keep doing that. Anyway, thank you thank so you. much. One thing I want to say, by the way, is that uh, we're going to continue on to the next section, and we'll take a break in, in an hour. But, but uh, when we take a break, there are books outside. Those of you who've been at my things know I do this. Uh, this is free. That is an independent bookstore, McNally Jackson. They are the soul of our country. And we are going to lay them waste if we don't support them. So when we're finished here, I expect every one of you to buy books of these great people who are doing all this for free, too. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so, this section, we, we uh, the first section was kind of uh, poets and
playwrights and memory people, this next section for about an hour, we're going to think, talk to some scientists and, and bug people and mathematicians and so forth. And, and I assure you that the highlight of the day is going to happen in, in this next section toward the end of it. But uh, so don't go away. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to start with uh, uh, Stuart Firestein, who is here from, he's the head of biology at Columbia. But he also has, I asked him what he would do in solitary. And here he is to tell us, Stuart Firestein. Thank you. Thank you, Ren and, and Stephanie, for organizing this remarkable thing. I, I apologize. I'm sure all of you saw that I came in a bit late. I managed to miss the entire first part of the morning session. And all I can say is that all the usual excuses apply. Way too long to enumerate. So uh, Ren asked me to do this a, a couple of weeks ago. And of course, my first response is, I think, many people's first responses to the idea of solitary is they mix it up, I think, with solitude with notions of solitude, which have a much nicer connotation. So the first thing, if you're a busy person sort of thing, and uh, uh, too much in the world, as it were, thank you, is this, yeah, this is fine, uh, is that you think, oh, solitary. Well, that might be nice for a little while. I, maybe I'll get, you know, the cell phone will stop ringing off, and the emails will stop pinging, and so forth. But then I realized that I regularly catch myself in the urinal checking my email. So really, how much do I want to be away from this email? I've even given up the toilet as a solitary place. Um, and I think many of us do this as well. So, so really, maybe this idea is not quite so positive as we might at first think. Um, to maybe reinforce that a little bit, I, I, not intentionally, I, I went online to a few of these sort of quote sites, you know, brainy quotes or fascinating quotes or this, that. I figured I'd find some interesting quote about solitary or even solitude, perhaps, uh, that, that would be interesting to use. And what's remarkable is that I found that every one of the quotes is very positive. They're all in this kind of Ralph Waldo Emerson kind of idea of solitary. Uh, the rugged individual, the solitary man, the this, the that. But, but I couldn't find a negative quote about solitary, which I found sort of surprising. So, so I think this is maybe a, a kind of a mindset that we have that's, that's interesting to think about, at least. So uh, my, my uh, remit here today is to talk about the neuroscience of solitary, which we don't know much, but I'll tell you a little bit of what we do know. Uh, it's not my field in particular, but I know people who work in it, and I know some of the literature about it as well. Um, certainly, uh, one of the hotter areas of neuroscience now is evolutionary psychology and cognitive neuroscience areas that have been ignored for years but are kind of uh, very uh, strong now. And, and one of the clear findings, I think, from, from this, this work is that there's every indication that the, the, the significant expansion of the human brain, the size of the brain that we have, and its evolution into this size is highly dependent upon the fact that we became at some point a highly social, highly communicative animal. And that vast amounts of brain space are used to read social cues, to be social, to talk, of course, which is a social activity, and to participate in all these things. And that we find them, uh, we find them rewarding as well. That, that being social is, is rewarding, that you know, flirting is one of the more rewarding behaviors we do, it turns out. Uh, that assembling like this, let's remember that assembling is guaranteed to us by the framers of the Constitution, so the notion of being together in a, in a group and the possibility of doing so. So these are all rather rewarding kinds of things, and, and we, in fact, I could give you some spiel about dopamine flooding the brain when we do this and all that, but it's not so important, I think, at this point. But except to recognize that we understand sociality and communication and being, in pe being with people as being highly rewarding. Of course, if it's rewarding, then withdrawing it is likely to be punishing. And I think this is clearly something that's been recognized for centuries by jailers and wardens even by societies as a whole with things like ostracism and the effects that this can have on a person, on an individual personality. So clearly it's, it's used purely as punishment in that sense. Um, there's an interesting history, I suppose, in neuroscience of uh, studies of solitary or sociality, um, beginning with, I think, something that, that we all call the forbidden experiment. The forbidden experiment is 
uh, actually grew up in the linguistic area. There was the idea that are we born with language? Do we have some inert, innate kind of language thing in us? Or do we learn it, or are we acculturated by it? The whole nature versus nurture idea of things which may be a false dichotomy, but nonetheless has driven, has driven scientific inquiry and behavior and, and, and in neuroscience for quite some time. And so the idea of the forbidden experiment, of course, is what if you took a child from birth and raised it in a deprived condition. Ra raised it in solitude with no human contact, uh, with minimal sensory uh, input. What, what would this child have when you finally decided to test this child at 14 or 15 years of old, uh, 14, 15 years of age, would they be able to speak? Would they have any cultural abilities? Would they be able to see faces, understand friendly versus non-friendly? All of these things that we kind of take for granted, but we don't know whether they're innate or whether they're culture or which part of them is which or how much is which. So of course, as is the case with every forbidden experiment, it's almost surely been done, uh, if not published. And there are cases of it where it's been done maybe on purpose or maybe accidentally. Historically, the most famous one, I guess, is that of Caspar Hauser. Um, what's his name made a film of this? Um, Herzog. Herzog, sorry, yes. So Herzog made a film of the story, and it's a, it's a reasonably well-documented story of a young boy found in the town square of Nuremberg in the mid-1800s with a note pinned to him asking him to please take care of him. And eventually he learned rudimentary language and some social skills, but he was always not quite right, as you might imagine. And it came out that he'd been raised in some sort of a basement somewhere, um, that he never saw another human being, that he was, that food appeared when he was asleep, uh, they would occasionally cut his hair apparently, but that was it. And he had a couple of toys around and, and no more. And of course, uh, he grew up to be quite damaged as a personality. The story gets a little more bizarre in the end as he was murdered for some unknown reason uh, somewhat later in life. Uh, there's a whole intrigue thing that goes on about it, not so important. A more recent case, this was the case of uh, Jeannie, the young girl in Southern California that was written up by Russ Reimer. First as a New Yorker article and appears now as a book which I recommend highly, it's quite fascinating. Uh, Jeannie was brought up in these deplorable um, conditions of, of uh, having no contact and so forth and was damaged as a personality through the rest of her life. There are animal experiments that have gone on in this area, the most famous or infamous being those of Harry Harlow and the rhesus monkeys in which monkeys were raised, young monkeys were raised without a mother but just given a sort of a, a, a wire frame version of another, of another monkey and these monkeys are damaged for life by having this kind of rearing condition. Um, we don't even do those experiments on animals anymore, let alone on people. Um, of course, th these were developmental experiments, and so we know that, that solitary, uh, solitary conditions in a developing brain are disastrous and produce lifelong uh, uh, personality deficits, as well as all sorts of other deficits. I think we're less clear what happens to them in the adult brain. It's, less, it's harder to understand this. Of course, one can't do experiments, even though we, in some unofficial way, are doing experiments by, by keeping people in solitary confinement. But clearly, uh, there are, it, it's damaging, and it remains damaging in the same way that post-traumatic stress syndrome does. And there are things that you would never be able to get over. The brain changes. It remains plastic throughout life. Um, we should remember that the brain doesn't stop developing at birth, but develops at least through your mid-20s, maybe a little bit longer. And then it begins developing probably in the other way. I mean, as it, as it goes downhill as you uh, pass that age. But in any case, it remains plastic throughout your life. Plastic, I'm sorry, is a kind of a jargony word that we use in neuroscience, which means actually moldable, that it can be changed. It's a changeable thing. It's not set in stone, as it were. Um, and so clearly there must be effects, especially on a prison population that's primarily younger, uh, that's in, often in precisely that cru crucial developmental time point for brain in the, in the late teens and early 20s, all the way through, say, 30 years of age. Uh, other experiments that have gone on in neuroscience, of course, are sensory deprivation, uh, made, I guess, originally famous by John Lilly in the 1960s as sensory deprivation tanks in which people would go into a tank of uh, body temperature water suspended in the, uh, the high salt content, so you were suspended, it felt gravity free, there was no light, there was no sound and so forth. And of course, people would begin to hallucinate almost immediately uh, within several minutes. Uh, become highly hallucinatory. These were the same people that were screwing around with LSD and the like, so it wasn't necessarily considered a negative, but it clearly would be over a longer period of time. Um, 
and this, this notion that it becomes hallucinatory is quite interesting. Uh, I personally believe, and I'm, and I'm not, not quoting any particular research because I don't know any done in this area, but I believe we'll begin to find that the kind of hallucinations that you have mentally in a solitary or solitude sort of place are not so different in the end from that of uh, phantom limbs. So I'm sure you're all familiar with situations where somebody loses an arm or something like that, but they continue to feel the arms being there, often being twisted or moved in funny positions. And, um, and this is generally believed to be because the brain, of course, expects input from the nerves in the arm, and when it doesn't get it, it makes it up. So it essentially hallucinates an arm that's not there. Interestingly, almost all phantom limb type hallucinations are painful. Um, why that has to be, I'm not clear on, of course, but, but the brain generally, it seems, interprets inappropriate signals as being painful. This would somehow or another make, I guess, sense, but only in a post hoc kind of way. So, so it wouldn't be surprising then that the kind of hallucinations, mental hallucinations, psychic hallucinations that could develop out of solitary would be painful in that psychic kind of way as well. I, I, I believe that there would be a connection there, or one, a connection worth at least sort of uh, looking for. Of course, another, another kind of solitary that shows up in neuroscience or neurology is something called locked-in syndrome. This is a, a rare but devastating uh, pathology of the brain uh, in which usually due to some sort of a massive stroke or occasionally an injury or a, a, a progressive debilitating disease, a person becomes more and more, as it were, locked into their head. That is, they lose all ability to control their muscles. They have no behavior, but they're there in their head. There's no cognitive deficit, particularly. They can't do anything except maybe blink an eye. For example, a recent example of this was the French, what's his name, slipped through my head, the butterfly and the diving mm -hmm. bell. Yes, um, uh, uh, what was his name? I can't, it just went right out of my head. That'll come back, yes. Yes, anyway, so that, that was one example. Also, quite, quite an interesting film was made of it, and, and he managed to write the book, of course, but literally by blinking one eye. That's all he had left. But there was a mind in there, and yet he was in some ways completely cut off and in some solitary situation. Um, I was at a meeting recently where Stephen Hawking was there, the great physicist, and he's very, very close to being in this situation. So over the years, this progressive some form of ALS that he seems to have, although it's not clear what the actual disease is, but it continues to progress to the point where he really can do very little but move his cheek. And so he has a sensor on his cheek that kind of runs a computer, but, but he knows that's on its way out as well and will be locked in. Um, and he's otherwise completely mentally healthy, but is more and more detached. And you can see that there's, a, I mean, he, he's very open about the fear of this happening finally, of his being locked in. Let me. Um, let me sort of finish this with a, with a, with a, a sort of an, an unscientific, um, th that is, it was, a, it was a survey, not done scientifically, but a survey that was done by one of the National Institutes of Health, the NIDCD. This is the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communicative Disorders. I happen to know about this survey in a quirky kind of way because the National Institutes of Health, which funds most scientific research, uh, biological life sciences research, and most neuroscience research in this country is organized around diseases because we all think we should be paying for them to cure diseases. Uh, in point of fact, they support a great deal of basic fundamental research as well. But nonetheless, the institutes are all named after diseases. So there's the National Eye Institute, National Cancer Institute, et cetera, et cetera. And I, my laboratory, it so happens, works on the olfactory system. The sense of smell is a kind of a window onto the brain and its functions. Um, and so we're covered by an institute called the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communicative Disorders, which is a kind of a, uh, what you call it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase that's a <laughs> intentionally maybe not so obvious, but it covers all the other sensory systems except the eyes, because vision has its own institute. But of course we call it deafness because that's the one with the greatest pathology. There's not much pathology, serious pathology associated with loss of your sense of smell. Uh, although people can, well, that's another rant for another time. So in any case, uh, these institutes compete against each other to some extent for a chunk of the total NIH budget. And so they're always looking to get their patient base to be the most injured in some way or another um, and the most strenuously lobbying Congress and so forth. So the National Institute of Communicative, Deafness and Communicative Disorders ran a survey in which they surveyed, they asked questions of both blind people and deaf people. And the, 
It was a lengthy survey, but the, but the final basis of it, the final question more or less was, they would ask blind people if, given the possibility of regaining their sight but losing their hearing, would they make that trade off? And remarkably, the answer turned out to be almost 100% no. No. Now you might say, well, because I'll take what I have, I don't want to go somewhere I'm not, I don't know what that is, I'll just, I've learned to be blind, so I'll be blind. Um, but it turned out that when the same question, but in reverse, was asked of people who were deaf, that is, if you could get your hearing back, would you give up your sight? Their answer was yes. Almost, again, 100%. Because deafness, they felt, cut them off from human contact. They were not part of the social fabric. They couldn't partake in conversations normally. They couldn't go to a party and be part of things. Uh, whereas blindness for them was, although a disability, but one that you could work around. But deafness cuts you off. Uh, I think we see this um, regularly, and we don't take enough note of it, in the geriatric population. Whereas you lose hearing, the major complaint of older people is they no longer feel a part of things. They'll sit in the room with the family, but they're not in the conversation. They can't hear well enough, and so they're out of it somehow or another. And I think this notion uh, speaks very strongly to the idea of, of being in solitary, of being separated from the, the kind of input, the social input that comes from just simple contact, but of course speech is one way and hearing and so forth and so on. But I think it's just indicative of the crucial importance of contact to the brain in general. I mean, many animals are this way, but certainly to the human brain. And, uh, and, and I think personally, we should be very careful about depriving a brain of this before we understand what it means to not have it. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, will you take you a few minutes to set up, or are you set up? Are you? Um, okay. Well, well just yeah. one second. Yeah, yeah. While, while she's setting up, okay. In a second, we're going to have how you could befriend a bug. But but while she's <laughs> setting up, I was just going to ask you a question. Sure. Um, I know that if you're you, you mentioned this in passing uh, that you would have to get in, go through incredible protocols to do experiments on human beings nowadays especially the forbidden experiment. Especially. <laughs> Would you even be able to go through a protocol to do experiments on people in solitary? You've got 80,000 of them there. You could, it would be great to do well, experiments that, on those people. <laughs> or would you be forbidden to do it? Is it I'm, so bad I'm, that you would be forbidden to do it? I'm really shocked to even hear you suggest this yeah. in a way. Yes, I think it would. Well, I mean, the fact that you already of course, there's always the slippery slope of, gee, if this research gets interesting, then you know we'll slip the warden another 50 bucks and throw yeah. somebody else in solitary because yeah. we need to increase the number of uh, subjects. So that would be one reason why I think you wouldn't want to do it, and that would be an No, I don't want to do it, but, but, right. but in a way, the rhetorical point I make is that you wouldn't be allowed to do this? Uh, it, well, I, I don't think you would. I think you would have some struggle. I mean, I don't do human experiments, mm -hmm. so I don't really deal with these IRBs that are called the Institutional Research Boards which okay these experiments. I believe you would probably have quite a bit of trouble getting through, although I don't think you would have a problem necessarily saying we would like to, um, we would like to have uh, uh, prisoners who have been in solitary confinement have a, an fMRI mm -hmm. um, immediately afterwards or undergo a psychological examination. In fact, you could see that this would be the appropriate thing to do, mm -hmm. not just as an examination and not just for data, but as therapy. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to put somebody in solitary, you owe them the therapy when you take them yeah. out. Just want, right, you tell me when you're ready. But but while, while, yeah, yeah. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, let me just ask you the question I've, I asked Josh and so forth. You've just been thrown in solitary. How would yep. you pass the time of day? Uh, so I thought about that for a while because you asked me that on the phone when we talked, and I I. I you know, that's the problem. I thought, well, this would be really a kind of a nice break and all. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized I, I have the opportunity to be in solitary if I want to be, and I never take it, do I? So I don't have a plan for being in solitary, but I'm going to think about it now. <laughs> because clearly, one should, one could be. And um, I mean, not just by virtue of being in prison, but it, mm -hmm. you know, it's possible in, in many aspects. Mm -hmm. I mean, ostracism, as I say, has been used by cultures for a long time, sure. and who knows sure. when when that could even happen. So, so I don't know really what I would do. I mean, I think I would try mental tricks. I will say this, I do believe that one of the things we don't think about the brain enough is that it's, it, it has a very strong motor side to it. That is, activity is very important for the brain as well. Maybe more important than thinking and doing crossword puzzles and all that. Hmm. There's actually recent evidence that suggests 
should all take this into account, that um, physical activity has a better effect on the aging brain than doing crossword puzzles and Sudoku and things like that. Hmm. That you actually keep the brain in better shape by even minimal physical activity, walking and things like that. So there's a very strong motor, we call it, component to the brain. And I think maybe that's one of the things that people probably don't think about doing in solitary. But it's, hmm. I think it would be very important to keep moving. Okay. Are you guys just about ready? Ooh, God. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thank you so much, Stuart. Thank you, Ren. Catherine, can you help us befriend a bug? Oh, I'll try. Do we want this light? We do. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, befriending a bug. Are we ever really alone if we consider the ubiquity of the invertebrates? Flies, spiders, ants, and cockroaches all could easily come and go through the cracks of a prison cell as if they were freeways, challenging the very notion of solitary. But would a bug offer companionship and therefore comfort? Or would their presence incite further terror to a confined individual? What are the physical and behavioral characteristics of an arthropod that might influence these opposite reactions? Take the fly, for example. Their incessant buzzing, always out of reach, small, quick, hard to kill, could drive anyone mad. We loathe them for spreading disease and for their larvae eating us when we die. If a fly was your only companion, could you see it in another light? The same dramas of the hum human world, birth, sex, predation, war, and death, play out in the insect world. They're just on a smaller scale and take more patience to observe. Flies have earned their moniker, they breed like flies. And to do that, they have a lot of sex. They put on a veritable mini porn show. That might entertain a sex-starved prisoner. Uh, this is a male um, getting ready to mate. Uh, classic sex. Creative sex. Uh, two males and a female. A female spreading her legs and wings after she has had multiple partners. Birth. And the ravages of old age. Humans tend to like animals with eyes. The bigger, the rounder, the better. We certainly prefer eyes to antenna. Two legs are better than four, which is usually preferable to six, and no doubt for most people, superior to eight. Besides having too many legs, spiders don't even have heads. And most importantly, they don't have eyes that we can look into and relate to. Most spiders have an eye cluster mounted on a torso. Their morphology offers little opportunity for traditional engagement and companionship. But they make art. Orb weavers even make and remake their art daily, changing a solitary confinement cell into a spider's studio. Webs are beautiful by any definition of art. Gossamer, delicate, intricate, and composed. They are three-dimensional sculptures hanging in space. Who cares about a spider's lack of expression when their web it spins is a masterpiece of expression? It's difficult to befriend a bug 
if you cannot be certain to whom you are speaking. One fly is hard to distinguish from another. But spiders have a home address. If you call your new friend Charlotte, you can be fairly certain you are still talking to her the next day if her web is in the same general location. And Charlotte's art is lethal. If your cell has both a fly and a spider, you are in for a glorious performance of nature's ability to spin life into a dizzying ball of death. Perhaps an isolated human being might embrace the chance to spend time with another species with whom we share our unique socialness. Ants are a sophisticated social species with complex communication, organized division of labor. They are master chemists and accomplished architects. Ants invented a network communication system that rivals the internet. Without central command, individual antenna touches are like Google hits. Complex decisions are made. Ant conversation is not top down, but bottom up. Not command and control, but connect and collaborate. At some point, a message goes viral. Leave some food for the ants, and those antenna touches will communicate a message to come visit you. To feed and care for another being, or hundreds of beings, has proven health and emotional benefits. But provide too great a bounty, and a rival colony might challenge for a place at your buffet. Is there a social species that doesn't engage in warfare? To incite an ant war is to see many gladiators locked in epic battle. I cannot imagine a creature more hated than the cockroach. The word itself is an insult in many languages. But on what is this based? They don't bite or sting or carry the dangerous pathogens that flies and mice regularly do. There is nothing life-threatening about a cockroach. Would it be possible to put disgust aside and draw companionship from one of the world's most successful creatures? Getting past the dark, twitchy exterior the roach is a remarkably remark subtle and sculptural. Its wings are a glowing translucent amber, and its long, elegant antenna explore the world with the grace of a ballerina's arms. Even cockroaches, which are not defined as a social species, seek out each other's company. When they are kept in isolation, they have significantly reduced lifespans. Like us, they enjoy hanging out together when they drink and when they eat. Their molting is a magical moment of transformation. The roach walks up and down the wall to make sure it has enough room, then it hangs upside down and drops out of its old skin. The newly emerged roach is white and delicate and soft. Cockroach sex lasts for nearly an hour. The female mates once, consequently is quite choosy, and then is pregnant for life. But maybe you are buying none of this. For some people, solitary confinement is preferable to the company of insects. Then at least a bug could provide a rare opportunity 
for the expression of control over your environment as you chase it around the cell and simply squish it out of existence. Humans have been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, just one question before you, you go away. You spend a lot of time with bugs, and a lot of the language you use is you get to watch them go to war. You get to, in other words, you do human projections onto bugs. Do you find yourself feeling more buggy? <laughs> uh, does, it, does the projection go the other way around? Do you find yourself? Um, I wouldn't say. Fortunately, that I feel buggy. But um, when I first ordered, when I ordered my first batch of cockroaches and started raising them, I think it was two weeks straight where every dream I had, the characters in the dream, even though they were human personalities and the normal dramas of a dream, were all cockroaches. Mm -hmm. I only saw cockroaches. I didn't <laughs> see, and most of them were flooding and escaping and terrifying me. And then when I went to the tropics for the first time to work with leafcutter ants. I saw, I saw ants flowing for about a week, and it took a long time to switch out of sort of the ant dumb back into the human mm. drama. But I, it was I, really I, I wonder in the context of somebody in solitaire, if they were befriending a bug, whether they would, how their dreams would play out in that way. Well, chances are you wouldn't have the sheer number that I did, and yeah, I think no, that's yeah, sure. what was so terrifying. And the cockroaches, because I was keeping them in terrariums, um, the, and I was terrified of them. The idea of them escaping, of course, was just the, the I mean, uh, you know, a cockroach will come and go in a cell. It won't, it won't be, you yeah, know, yeah. in their numbers. Hmm. By the way, she, the, when you go out later on, the, her two books are just amazing, so you'll enjoy those. Thank you so much. Thank you. Carl. Uh, Carl Skelton is going to tell us a story about another scientist. Uh, and. Oops. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carl Skelton, and I'm a recovering academic. <laughs> I have uh, worked as an artist, a community organizer, uh, as the founding director of integrated digital media programs in a small independent engineering school, which is now a small dependent engineering school <laughs> of NYU. I found myself a year and a half ago uh, running a joint research and development project with the Institute for Angewandte Medienforschung uh, at the University of Bremen, uh, which was a doctoral dissertation project involving distributed creative solutions to urban design and development issues, which is, of course, always a sporting proposition in New York. Uh, looking at my fifth department head and provost in six years, a non-performing co-author on another book about experimental multimedia, uh, and realizing that if I wanted to get any work done, I was going to have to quit my job. Um, which I did, uh, actually. And my wife, to whom I shall be forever grateful, for going along with this idea and for being happy about it after I made a pen of lasagna to celebrate my availability to domestic chores. Um, the, uh, uh, I also, of course, am continuing with the getting done of the work, part of which, because one of the books was about experimental multimedia programming, which involved having to rethink uh, the, a timeline of the development of these things outside the scope of the rather parochial histories that have been written of media. Uh, and along the way, found myself browsing in the way that people browsed before you needed a computer to do it, and came across a guy 
who had to make much more complicated and extreme um, decisions, I guess, uh, and got really terrific results. Roughly in 965 AD, a boy was born into a prominent family in Basra and named Abu Ali al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Haytam. Uh, and being from a family which you would think of as prominent or privileged or fancy, uh, depending on how you approach uh, these kinds of structures, uh, found himself in a high government post having been deeply immersed in study, uh, which was, of course, uh, at that point likely to be, and indeed was, a, what is now an unthinkable mashup of theology, the physical science, and mathematics, uh, and what is much less unthinkable now, distraught at the intractability of controversies between Shiites and Sunnis uh, in matters important, and resolved to the extent that he could to address questions to which answers actually might exist and might be verifiable. Um, and so undertook to neglect, perhaps, uh, as much as possible, his bureaucratic duties in favor of these longer range questions. Uh, the point of crisis uh, for Ibn al-Haytam uh, came when he found himself facing the Caliph of Cairo, a notoriously, uh, how to put it delicately, enthusiastically eccentric and capricious ruler, uh, noted for such uh, creative acts of contemporary performance art as having all the dogs in a town he'd just conquered killed because they barked too much. Um, and the caliph had the expectation, uh, and it was perhaps Ibn al-Haytam's own fault that he did, there's some vagueness about this, that Ibn al-Haytam would be able to engineer what we now know as the Aswan Dam. Uh, and according to stories which may or may not be apocryphal, because of course the story of this man's life rings so profoundly with the life of any academic uh, who's found themselves at way too many meetings doing way too much administration to think straight and fantasized a decade of solitary confinement as the only possible way they might undertake to actually succeed at the career to which they're committed. Ibn al-Haytam therefore found himself in front of the caliph uh, obliged to say that he could not deliver on this promise for at least a thousand years. Um, and the solution, as it is recorded, is that Ibn al-Haytam feigned madness uh, in order, A, not to put the caliph in the position of finding it amusing to have him executed in some creative way, uh, and B, in order to provide himself with what he had really wanted all along, which was uh, what turned out to be a decade of privacy. Now, this is variously described as prison or house arrest, depending on which version you get. It was a while ago. Um, and during the course of the 10 years between this arrangement being set up uh, and the death of the caliph, thus depriving Ibn al-Haytam of his imprisonment, um, he wrote what may have been 92 books. Um, and in particular, he wrote seven books of optics uh, as the first major upgrade since Ptolemy's Almagest of about seven or eight centuries previous. And in particular, going back to this business of the distress at the factional problem, uh, something about which it turns out academics know a lot, uh, he um, set himself the task, one, of being skeptical in relation to 
the literature. Uh, two, of producing a methodological rather than factional reconciliation of what they called at the time the physicists, people who would do experimental stuff, and the mathematicians. Um, and left alone, he then more or less formulated what we now think of as the scientific method, in which the experiment is not just a demonstration, but a test of an idea about how the world really works. And, of course, combines, on the one hand, rigorous review of the literature, on the other, rigorous definition of very specific questions, and on the third, uh, the business of isolating particular pieces of reality and testing them very specifically and subjecting those physical experiments to rigorous mathematical analysis. The reconciliation of logic and sensation. Now, one of the other bits, and this brought me back to this business of how musicians will tell you that arrangement of musical structures from field recordings was invented by a musician, which happens to have happened about 15 years after it was invented by a filmmaker, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what I had accepted, as many of us have, as Western science, in fact, depended in large measure on a Latin translation of the 13th century of this optics and its methodology, which were something beyond the state of the art until they were taken up in the 17th century by people like Kepler and Huygens. And so while on the one hand, I now have a lot more time to actually engage in the broader social creative realm, the question through the Betaville project, uh, that I've been working on with these folks in Bremen continuously, uh, whether indeed communities can be creators, can be artists of their own physical environment. Um, I will also never again use the phrase Western science without remembering the name Abu Ali Al-Hassan Ibn Al-Hassan Ibn Al-Haytam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So that's the that's what you, uh, that's something to aspire to in, in, in solitary is is Indeed. reinventing the entire world of optics. But um, uh, we're now going to go to another mathematician, and this is uh, so we'll, we'll turn this up. Uh, I was very much hoping we could get Vihart here. Vihart, I've decided, is the Greta Garbo of the web. Um, how many of you know about Vihart already? Yeah. Uh, I have tried to for the six, last six months to correspond with her. And she, I think everybody in the world must want to correspond with her. At any rate, she doesn't correspond with me. Uh, on the other hand, her, I think I'm going to get all of you hooked on. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go to the hexaflexagon one, I think, the first one. Uh, yeah. Um, she has this remarkable voice. She, she began appearing f three or four years ago uh, with a series of videos of mathematical doodles, uh, she would, which always took the form of, so you're sitting in your math class, and it's so boring, and you start doodling. And then she develops all these, these are little four or five minute videos. And after tonight, I, today, I think you'll start watching them yourself. But um, uh, the one I want to show you today is, is with in mind what you could do if you were in solitary confinement if all you had was a piece of paper. Uh, she invents, she talks about this thing called hexaflexagons. And so I wrote her one of those notes that if I don't hear from you, I'm assuming I can do this, and I didn't hear from her. So, uh, so what we'll do for starters is, is uh, show you this little four-minute four video about hexaflexagons, and then we'll do something else with it in a second. So why don't we show that, this video? But we have to get the sound. So let's go back and... Let's start it from scratch. And if you can turn down all the house lights, please. That's not the sound. 
Just a second. Just moved from England to the U.S. and you've got your old school supplies from England and your new school supplies from the U.S. and it's your first day of school and you get to class and find that your new American paper doesn't fit in your old English binder. The paper is too wide and hangs out. So you cut off the extra and end up with all these strips of paper. And to keep yourself amused during your math class, you start playing with them. And by you, I mean Arthur H. Stone in 1939. Anyway, there's lots of cool things you can do with a strip of paper. You can fold it into shapes and more shapes. Maybe spiral it around snugly like this. Maybe make it into a square. Maybe wrap it into a hexagon with a nice symmetric sort of cycle to the flappy parts. In fact, there's enough space here to keep wrapping the strip, and then your hexagon is pretty stable. And you're like, I don't know, hexagons aren't too exciting, but I guess it has symmetry or something. Maybe you could kind of fold it so the flappy parts are down and the unflappy parts are up. That's symmetric, and it collapses down into these three triangles, which collapse down into one triangle. And collapsible hexagons are, you suppose, cool enough to at least amuse you a little bit during your class. And then, since hexagons have six-way symmetry, you decide to try this three-way fold the other way, with flappy parts up, and they're collapsing it down when suddenly the inside of your hexagon decides to open right up. What? You close it back up and undo it. Everything seems the same as before. The center is not open upable. But when you fold it that way again, it like flips inside out. Weird. This time instead of going backwards, you try doing it again, and again, and again, and... You want to make one that's a little less messy, so you try again with another strip and tape it nicely into a twisty foldy loop. You decide it would be cool to color this side, so you get out a highlighter and make one yellow. Now you can flip from yellow side to white side. Yellow side, white side, yellow side, white side, yep. Hmm. White side? What? Where did the yellow side go? So you go back, and this time you color a white side green, and find that your piece of paper has three sides, yellow, white, and green. Now this thing is definitely cool, therefore you need to name it, and since it's shaped like a hexagon, and you flex it, and flex rhymes with hex, hexaflexagon it is. That night you can't sleep because you keep thinking about hexaflexagons, and the next day, as soon as you get to your math class, you pull out your paper strips. You'd made this sort of spirally folded paper that folds into, again, the shape of a piece of paper, and you decide to take that and use it like a strip of paper to make a hexaflexagon, which should totally work, but it feels sturdier with the extra paper. And you color the three sides and are like, orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, pink. And you're sort of trying to pay attention to class, math, yeah, orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, white? Wait a second. Okay, so you color that one green, and now it's orange, yellow, green, orange, yellow, green, who knows where the pink side went. Oh, there it is. Now it's back to orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, pink, hmm, blue. Yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, huh. With the old flexagon, you could only flex it one way, flappy way up. But now there's more flaps, so maybe you can fold it both ways. Yes, one goes from pink to blue, but the other from pink to orange. And now one way goes from orange to yellow, but the other way goes from orange to neon yellow. During lunch, you want to show it off to one of your new friends, Bryant Tuckerman. You start with the original, simple, three-faced hexaflexagon, which you call the trihexaflexagon. And he's like, whoa, and wants to learn how to make one. And you're like, it's easy. Just start with a paper strip. Fold it into equilateral triangles, and you'll need nine of them. And you fold them around into this cycle and make sure it's all symmetric. Like, the flat parts are diamonds, and if they're not, then you're doing it wrong. And then you just tape the first triangle to the last along the edge, and you're good. But Tuckerman doesn't have tape, after all. It was invented only ten years ago. So he cuts out ten triangles instead of nine, and then glues the first to the last. Then you show him how to flex it by pinching around a flappy part and pushing it on the opposite side to make it flat and triangly, and then opening from the center. You decide to start a flexagon committee together to explore the mysteries of flexigation. But that will have to wait until next time. Now, let me just tell you that if you go to her thing, uh, you will get to part two. We won't do it right now because there's nothing much better to do. Uh, so let's hit the lights. Um, you can also watch her make hexaflexa tacos or, or, or burritos. Uh, hexaflexa mexagons. He hexaflexa mexagons, exactly. Anyway, to give you some idea of how this works, uh, Carl's daughter, Pearl, is right over here. Can you come up here? We actually need to mic her up. No. Do we have a mic for her? One? Yeah, you, you put, yeah, let's put that on her. Um, because uh, I don't have a about a month ago, I, I showed this video to Pearl. And what did you do? Um, <clears throat> I. You, you can just come over here. We can sit here. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. Okay, come over here. Sit over here. You can sit right there.
That's one of the reasons I would never seriously entertain solitaire. Okay, <laughs> okay, very good. So tell, tell us what you did. Um, I found out how to make it. Actually, my dad showed me how, and eventually, after a couple tries, I succeeded in making the hexaflexagon. And um, I found out, like, all, like, um, did you make I, a few? Yeah, I made a couple of them. And uh, how many altogether did you end up making with your friends? Well, at first I just like showed my mom and she and me started making some for you to, for this presentation. And do, do you have some here that we can hand out? Yeah, like several. Like how um, many? Not a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> So why don't we, Josh, you take some and give some to Josh, and, but keep the ones you need for yourself. OK. Um, wait. So hand them out to people, Josh. And other people, everybody get, don't say that we don't provide entertainment here at the, at the Institute. Um, so, so tell us about these. Um, wait, Dad, where's my mom? Where the heck is she? She's up handing them out over there, right? Because I need the big one. Where's the big one? Uh -oh. Okay, just I a second. I need the big one. Yeah, okay. This is her flunky mother over here. <laughs> that and the other one that's already folded. There's, there are your tools and your markers. Oops, sorry. Mom, I had one that was already colored. Oh, oh, oh. A big one. You know what, I think we left that one at home. Oh. <laughs> That's where we got that. <clears throat> so, and okay. so this is one that we uh, prepped to show you guys. And see, like you saw, you <clears throat> you take a pip, uh, strip of paper and you fold it into equilateral triangles. And nine are needed. And then the, the triangles want to go the way you crease them. And so you fold them into a flexagon. Uh, and you need the flat parts to be diamonds. And then you tape the first to the last. Like this. <clears throat> and then you pinch the two triangles together and you open it up. Now I'm going to color these. Okay, so. What? This is not the side number one. Show everybody the side number one. Which I'm coloring like this. And then number two, <clears throat> which will be. Side number three. So this is a, you'd think it would just have two sides, but it has three sides. Yeah, it does. And then there's a six-sided one. Mom, can you get me the six-sided one? Which, unfortunately, we can't hand out because we only brought one. <clears throat> and but show it to people as, you, as it goes through. We only have a little one. And so blue, snowflake. Faces, like green leaves. And now you're just going around those faces, green leaves, faces. Yeah, and, and then, then with flowers, birds. Hold on. Wait, was that all six? No, I don't think so. Oh, and wait, oh shoot. It's kind of hard to get to all six. I think I got, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go it takes a one. long time to get to the sixth one. Then it's really yeah. surprised when you get it, right? Um, and then I'm going to go backwards, because that's easy. There, number six. Um, 
can you imagine it? Have you spent a lot of time doing this? Can you, is it like exciting as you discover more things about it? And um, kind of. And like these are pretty easy to like mess up. Like sometimes um, uh, in the country when we went apple picking, um, I took one of the six-sided ones and I somehow I don't know how I managed to do it, but I messed it up. So I had two of another color of like one of the other sides on like, so say these two were yellow and this rest was blue and all of them were like that and it was kind of annoying and I couldn't figure out how to fix it. So eventually I just gave up on that one and made another one. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, and one of the things that's fascinating and, and, and that in the second part of, of uh, of uh, Vi Hart's thing, she starts thinking about the mathematics of this, and, she, and you begin to think about if you label them one, two, three, four, five, six, it goes one, two, one, two, one, three, three, four, and so forth, and then four shows up, and you can try, start trying to figure out the math. You could spend a lot of time thinking about this, couldn't you? Yeah, and for the six-sided hexaflexagon, um, you need eighteen triangles, and then you twist it and you make that into a hexagon, and it's kind of more complicated. I don't, I haven't done that yet. Um, I've tried, but I always mess up. <laughs> um, but these, I found easier and easier to make. With a smaller strip of paper, it is now quite easy for me to get um, the equilateral triangle, but on this, we needed to measure it. We needed that big. Yeah. Uh huh. Huh. And can you describe? We won't show the video, but can you describe what a hexaflexamexa is? A mexagon is? Oh, it's um, you make a hexaflexagon out of a quesadilla, and then you put guacamole and like sour cream on one side, and then you flex it, and then so the guacamole is safely tucked into the flaps, like... Safely tucked into the flaps, yes. Because, like, look, so I'm going to get this to disappear by, like, hold on. I can get this, the two, tucked in like that. Now you can't see it. So the guacamole was in there. So what number was the guacamole? It was uh, one. And and, yeah. and, 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 then, and when you have two and three on the outside, the guacamole's on the inside, yeah, right? Um, yes. And then the second one is beans and cheese. Yeah. And then you flex it only halfway and you take a bite right here. <laughs> is, it me is it messy? Looks like it. I haven't made it yet. I see. But, it's, it, 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 but burritos are supposed to be messy, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, I think we're going to come to a stop right now but, but, and take a little break. Just talking about that got me all hungry, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think we, Pearl owes a great set of gratitude. Thank you for, make, for bringing us those things. And now, before we take the break, I'm going to tell you again, there's a bookstore out there. All the people here have, have books and so forth. There's great things out there to get. It's a wonderful bookstore. Buy books. We'll see you here in half an hour with some more stuff. Thank you. And Pearl will stay here for a second and talk to you if you want to talk okay. to her about it. OK? There you go. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to start this uh, last section of dreams of solitaire, the sorts of things that one might do if one might imagine doing if one were in solitary. And we're going to start with Walter Murch, uh, who, once again, we don't give long introductions because the introductions are all inside your flyers. But Walter is one of the great film and sound editors and has thought a lot about the qualities of film, sound, and so forth, and, and we'll have him. Uh, the, the, edit, the, the, the editor of, one of the great editors of sound is having trouble with the microphone. <laughs> but one of the great techs. Spiro wasn't here when we applauded the tech people before, so applaud Spiro. <laughs> great. So here's Walter Murch. <laughs> There are two slightly hyperbolic, but only slightly 
hyperbolic quotes that uh, came to mind when I was thinking about this subject. Um, one is from Blaise Pascal, and the other is from Goethe. Uh, Pascal uh, said, all human evil comes from the inability of a human being to sit in a room uh, all by himself quietly. Uh, on the other hand, Goethe said, um, a man can stand anything except a long succession of ordinary days. So the, the person in solitary confinement is uh, isolated between these two uh, polarities. Um, I clearly have no personal experience uh, of this except uh, tangentially, tangentially being a film editor. Um, one, uh, Arthur Kessler, who I'm going to uh, read from his uh, book, uh, his experience on solitary confinement, um, <clears throat> wrote a book, Darkness at Noon, which involved brainwashing. Um, and in the book, he defined brainwashing as being uh, locked in a uh, confined environment under various degrees of stress in an environment where people don't have your best interests at heart with the same material repeated over and over and over again. And if you, if you erase some of the uh, precision in the lines, that's uh, sort of what a film editor experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> um, there's a, a curious uh, phrase uh, about being in prison, which is doing time. And it's just, it's an odd, but apt. I mean, we all know what that means, but when you try to break it down, it doesn't quite make sense. How do you do time? Time doesn't seem capable of being done. Um, but this was the experience of Arthur Kessler, who at that time in 1937 was still a member of the Communist Party, uh, had gone to Spain uh, as a reporter uh, and partly as a spy. Um, and was caught and uh, behind nationalist lines and uh, almost killed at the moment he was caught, um, thrown in jail uh, and condemned to death, thrown in solitary confinement and condemned to death. Um, he wound up spending 90 days uh, in that uh, circumstance. He was finally, he, he got out because he was ex there was a prisoner exchange from, from the other side, and that's, that's how he got out. Um, but he lived on a day-by-day -day basis knowing that this day might be his last, that he had no human uh, contact other than the warden, or the, the prison guard who would come and bring food uh, to him. And every day in this prison of 1,500 people, 37 Prisoners were executed by firing squad, um, and nobody knew in advance whether that would be you or not. So the, the nightly patrols of who was going to be taken out uh, was a, 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 a nightly thing that uh, they all endured. Uh, he wrote a book about this experience called Dialogue with Death, and um, I'm just going to read a few paragraphs from it because it's a highly perceptive author put in this extremely unusual situation um, for somebody of his, uh, just the, the ability that he had to, to talk about this is, is re remarkable. <clears throat> it, it's a unique sound. A cell door has no handle, either outside or inside. It cannot be shut except by being slammed. It is made of massive steel and concrete, about four inches thick, uh, and every time it falls, too, there is a resounding crash, just as though a shot has been fired. But this report dies away without an echo. Prison sounds are echoless and bleak. When the door has been slammed behind him for the first time, the prisoner stands in the middle of the cell and looks around. I imagine that everyone must behave in more or less the same way. First of all, he gives a fleeting look around the walls, and takes a mental inventory of all the objects in what is now to be his domain. The iron bedstead, the wash basin, the toilet, the barred window. <clears throat> Excuse me. His next action is invariably to try to pull himself up by the iron bars of the window and look out. He fails and his clothes are covered with white plaster 
uh, from the wall against which he has pressed himself. Indeed, he makes all sorts of laudable resolutions. He will do exercises every morning and he will learn a foreign language. He simply won't let his spirit be broken. He dusts off his clothes and continues his voyage of exploration around his puny realm, five paces by long by four paces across. He tries the iron bed. The springs are broken. The wire mattress sags and cuts into the flesh. He, it's like lying in a hammock made of steel wire. He pulls a face, being determined to prove that he is full of courage and confidence. Then his gaze rests on the cell door, and he sees that an eye is glued to the spy hole, and it's watching him. The eye goggles at him glassily, its pupil unbelievably big. It is an eye without a man attached to it, and for a few moments the prisoner's heart stops, stops beating. The eye disappears, and the prisoner takes a deep breath presses his hand against the left side of his chest. Now then, he says to himself encouragingly, how silly to, get and to go and get so frightened. You must get used to that. After all, it's the officials, the officials only doing his duty by peeping in. That's part of being in prison. But they won't get me down. They'll never get me down. The daily routine of life, even of life in a condemned cell, cannot sustain for long the melodrama of despair. It banishes the agony to the dungeons of consciousness. From there, it makes itself heard only as a muffled bass drum in the symphony of the daily round and produces a vague feeling of uneasiness. Uneasiness and not unhappiness is the most common form of human suffering. That is, until an acute attack comes on. Then the lock gates give way and the boiling torrent of despair invades consciousness. The onslaught has begun. It's unbearable and one cannot stand it for long. One has to take a pill. Every man needs a different pill to help him arrive at a modus vivendi with his misery. Jo uh, the prisoners of Malaga sang the Internationale. I too had my pills, a whole collection of various sorts of them, from the equation of a hyperbola and my fill of days to every kind of synthetic product of spiritual pharmacy. One of my magic remedies was a certain quotation from a certain work of Thomas Mann's. Its efficacy never failed. Sometimes during an attack of fear, I repeated the same verse 30 or 40 times for almost an hour until a mild state of trance came on and the attack passed. I knew it was the method of the prayer mill of the African tom-tom, of the age-old magic of sounds. Yet, in spite of my knowing it, it worked. A similar effect to that of these anesthetizing exercises I could obtain by the opposite method, that is, by a sharp abstract speculation. I would start a train of thought deliberately at some given point, such as Freud's theory about death or the calculation of an elliptical orbit, after a few minutes, a state of feverish exaltation was evoked, a kind of running amuck in the realm of reasoning, which usually ended in a daydream. After a while, I became sober again and the attack had passed. The healing power of both methods was derived from the same device, that of merging the stark image of the firing squad with the general problem of life and death, of merging my individual misery with the biological misery of the universe. Just as the vibrations and tensions of a wireless receiver radio are conducted to earth where they disperse, I had earthed my distress. In other words, I had found out that the human spirit is able to call upon certain aids of which in normal circumstances it has no knowledge and the existence of which it only discovers in itself in abnormal circumstances. They act according to the particular case either as merciful narcotics or ecstatic stimulants. The technique which I developed under the pressure of the death sentence consisted in the skillful exploitation of these aids. The astonishing thing, the puzzling thing, and the consoling about, thing about this time was that it passed. I'm speaking the plain unvarnished truth when I say that I did not know how. I tried to catch it in the act I lay in wait for it, riveted my eyes on the second hand of my watch, resolved to think of nothing else but pure time. 
I held it like the simpleton in the fable who thought that to catch a bird, you had to put salt on its tail. I stared at the second hand for minutes on end, for quarters of an hour on end, until my eyes watered with the effort of concentration and a kind of trance-like stupor set in. And what I did not know afterwards was how long a time I had been observing in its passing. Time crawled through this desert of uneventfulness as though lame in both feet. I have said that the astonishing and consoling thing was that in this pitiable state it should pass at all. But there was something that was more astonishing, that positively bordered on the miraculous, and that was that this time, these interminable hours, days, weeks, months, passed more swiftly than a period of times has ever passed for me before. I was conscious of this paradox whenever I scratched a fresh mark on the white plaster of the wall, and with a particular shock of astonishment when I drew a circle around the marks to celebrate the passage of weeks and later the months. What? Another week, a whole month, a whole quarter of a year. Didn't it seem like only yesterday that this cell door had banged behind me for the first time? This time problem is the main problem of existence for every prisoner. And not only the prisoner, but of everyone who exists in unnatural confined conditions, in hospitals, in exile. It is truly strange, this uh, will-of-the-wisp time. If we experience time of such a quality that we have to look with a yawn at our watch to count the minutes, as soon as its existence is brought to our consciousness, we may be sure that it will be extinguished in the memory. The only time that is unforgettable is that time during which one forgets that time exists. Only that time is fertile, which remains chaste and unsullied by the touch of consciousness. While I was living down these blank days and speculating upon time, out in the courtyard, outside the window, the courtyard, uh, 37 men were shot, but I did not know it at this time. March 3rd, yesterday the first month of imprisonment is over. I am incapable of visualizing the future at all, concretely, despite constant speculation and forgetting. And, uh, and forging plans, but all plans are somehow dreamlike and unreal. All thought more and more takes the form of daydreaming. Whenever the cell door opens, fresh air from the corridor makes me dizzy and I have to hold on to the table. If a warder addresses me a word to me, I grow hoarse with excitement. Despite all my feelings of self-respect, I cannot help but look on the warders as superior beings. The consciousness of being confined acts like a slow poison, transforming the entire character. This is more than mere psychological change. It is not an inferiority complex. It is rather an inevitable natural process. When I was writing my novel about the gladiators, I always wondered why the Roman slaves, who were twice, three times as numerous as the free men, did not turn the tables on their masters. Now it is beginning gradually to dawn on me what the slave mentality really is. I could wish that everyone who talks of mass psychology should experience a year in prison. I, uh, okay. We lived an unusual life in that prison. The constant nearness of death weighed down and at the same time lightened our existence. Most of us were not afraid of death, only of the act of dying, and there were times when we overcame even this fear. At such moments we were free, men without shadows, dismissed from the ranks of the mortal. It was the most complete experience of freedom that can be granted. Such moments do not repeat themselves, and when one is back on the treadmill of ordinary life, all that remains is the feeling that one has forgotten something in cell number 41. Between the siesta and the evening meal one day, the cell door flew open and freedom was hurled at me like a club. I was stunned and stumbled back into life, just as, had things taken a different course, I should have stumbled into death. As I stood in the corridor, I shook from head to foot, overpowered by the same nervous trembling as on that night when someone outside my cell had called for help. Byron and the newcomer grasped me under the armpits 
and after a few steps, I am all right again. I feel the hot sun on my face, inhale a mouthful of air, and then everything suddenly turns gray, gray, green, and black, and I find myself sitting on the ground. At first, I can do nothing but breathe, breathe in the air, real air again for the first time, instead of the dense, gaseous mixture compounded of the odor of the stuffy bed, the stale food, and the stench of the toilet on which I have existed for the past months. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, two of my colleagues at, at, uh, at NYU, uh, uh, Jacques Servin of, of, uh, of the uh, Yes Men, who are kind of antic political activists and his colleague, uh, Mary Notari, uh, will talk to us. Well, I, the challenge I placed for them was, is it possible to, be, to do political activism in solitary? We're, we're kind of uh, clowns. We're an activist group called the Yes Men. Um, we run a Yes Lab at NYU where we help people come up with funny projects uh, around important issues. And Ren asked us if there was something we could do in solitary that would be uh, meaningful as activism, um, if there was any conceivable action we could do that would actually change anything about our circumstance or, or about anything. And, uh, and so, so, yeah. Oh, still yeah. working on the screen? Can we get the projector on? Here, let's go. So you can clip it. Oh, OK. Yeah, thank you. There it is, OK. Cool. So we tried to think about what we could do in solitary. Um, and uh, we came up with things like pretty much along the lines that we already do, which is come up with silly press releases, uh, silly announcements <laughs> to uh, make from our solitary cell. Um, and you know, we came up with a few things like this. And honestly, they're kind of lame. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> and present uh, another problem in and of itself, which is who are we releasing this to besides ourselves? Yeah, we quickly realized that, that the answer is no. And it was interesting to think through why no. Um, and I think the answer is that um, meaningful political action actually requires a bit of agency, um, an audience with some agency. And there's absolutely, um, and, and this is a, a nice chart explaining the concept. Um, so yeah, yeah. You, you could so mm -hmm. if there's no audience, um, what, or when you're in solitary, who is your audience? The guards, uh, the other inmates that are within uh, shouting distance from you, and like Jacques said, there's no agency, there's no purpose to yeah. be served by getting their attention. The warden who you think might have agency doesn't actually have agency. It's right. just rules and they're trained to deal with whatever comes their way. Um, it's the same thinking that you could actually do something to the wardens is kind of the mistake a lot of activists make, thinking you could appeal to CEOs of big companies that are ruled by their shareholders. You just can't do anything about it. There are rules, and, and they do what they're told um, by the market, or they're fired. So if the warden actually did something, you'd be fired, replaced by somebody who did. Um, and the only way you can actually do something um, the only way you could do something in solitary, I think, would be to imagine a future in which you have an audience that has a bit of agency. So once you get out or once you're moved to the general prison population, um, it would be funner to think about what you could do when you get out um, to actually do something about it. Yeah. And that'd be a great way of occupying ourselves um, while we imagine, at least while in solitary. Mm -hmm. um, so the sort of actions that we do, the sort of activism that we do, involve creative media actions, whether that's hijacking a brand, whether that's creating fake press releases or create companies and fake personas. Um, and we do all this with the aim of reaching a broad audience uh, with like a flash of information. So we boil down problems, we maybe translate them, could be a way of thinking about it, into sound bites that are easily replicable and communicate the issue in as short a time as possible. Alternately, we assemble those actions into a movie, and this is just a, uh, an opportunity to tell you we're making a movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
called the Isminar Revolting, which assembles a bunch of actions. And then you can sit people down, uh, not for as long as this conference, um, but for an hour and a half and transmit messages. But the kind of actions that we're talking about um, that you can use uh, to communicate something horrific, I don't know what we would actually come up with in solitary, but um, we'd start probably by thinking about what actions we could be inspired by. And there's a bunch of actions that have been done to communicate really horrible things, um, at least just a flash about them so that you start thinking about them and hopefully it guides you into following up and even more, um, even better uh, taking action on them. Uh, this is Operation First Casualty where veterans of the Iraq War um, against the war, staged the Battle of Fallujah in Times Square, impromptu, without telling anyone. Um, so here they're carrying wounded comrades. They also wrestle people to the ground and handcuff them. And the result is shock and a, a flash of recognition. And then they pass out information, uh, getting people uh, you know, where they recognize, uh, getting people to recognize what they've just seen. And one thing that uh, I'd like to add about uh, these type of actions is the whole purpose is to bring the reality of a, of something that is experienced by the people staging these actions to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And this is um, somebody who, uh, this is an Iraqi, Wafa Bilal, who made a website, uh, Dog or Iraqi. And this was around the Guantanamo uh, waterboarding controversy where suddenly we were allowed to waterboard uh, people, which it, it had been considered a form of torture and suddenly it was deemed not. So you could choose as a general internet visitor uh, which one you would waterboard, the dog or the Iraqi, and you could vote and click. Um, so the intention there, and uh, I won't tell you who won, um, but you could choose, you know, the, the idea was you would definitely not choose the dog, right? I mean, waterboarding a dog is horrific, so the, uh, that means you have to choose the person, and that's even more horrific. Um, it puts you in a real double bind, um, and another example of that is uh, puppy burning in the 60s. The Yippies would go around and post notices announcing puppy burnings um, at the main fountain on campus at noon. And uh, people would show up ready to see a, to stop this horrific thing. And they'd even hold up a puppy and some kerosene poured on the puppy. Uh, other people would be around to make sure people didn't interfere, take a match, and light the puppy on fire, except it was water, so the puppy didn't actually get catch on fire, and then they would say, well, you're, you're horrified about this dog, but we're actually burning people um, in Vietnam or napalm. And so it's a, a shock tactic to get that across. So that might be another way to find inspiration for um, what you might do around solitary confinement. Um, House Linda Ross, this takes a while to explain. Oh, um, yeah, and this is one of ours, actually. And by ours, I mean the Yes Lab. So the yes, the yes Lab is an organization that was started by the Yes Men to bring those tactics to other issues and campaigns and other organizations. So through the Yes Lab, um, a group of activists from the Bronx came to us wanting to do something uh, in response to the NYPD policy of stop and frisk. And uh, so what they came up with is a fiction. They created an entire fiction that involved a fake website, fake press releases, video, uh, corporate looking video, as well as uh, homespun uh, cell phone video. Um, and all was this, all this was in relation to was creating a fiction around a fake partnership between the NYPD and McDonald's. Um, and that the NYPD and McDonald's were partnering to respond to the community's outrage against the massive racial profiling that goes along with stop and frisk. And so by offering free Happy Meals to uh, victims of stop and frisk who were faced with no summons or charges or arrest, um, that was a way that they were responding and uh, a way of um, uh, garnering up outrage against this very real policy. Yeah, and this was the, the voucher where you would oh, yes. you know, print your name and ethnicity and then the badge number of the stopping and then of the officer each time and you take it to McDonald's. And this actually turned into a mainstream news program on a uh, news slot on ABC. Uh, so it was actually successful in getting the word out, which might, under excellent circumstances, translate into action to stop, stop, and frisk. Um, Here's the mother of all shock tactics. 
Uh, national television in Belgium plotted for two years to pull a, a, a prank on the Belgian populace. They um, interrupted a news program. That's the first image there as it's being interrupted. Um, pretended like they had a sudden very important announcement to make and they announced that the country was being split in two. Um, and that uh, Flanders was seceding from Wallonia and here's the newscaster standing in front of the uh, new Flemish parliament, replacing the Belgian parliament. And they spent two hours um, examining this, showing riot footage and all that, showing the king fleeing the palace, having um, talk shows um, where they would talk about the implications of this. Oh, this is terrible, this has happened. Uh, imagine the example to the rest of the world. Um, and, and so the point was to basically try to wake people up uh, with this uh, situation to the possibilities and to get people not to do it. So all this would, um, hopefully we could spend some time thinking about these things. This is gratuitous. Um, and just spend some time thinking about, um, you know, these, these, these things that people have actually done to raise awareness of these issues, um, which are horrific, maybe not quite as horrific in most cases, except the napalm one, as uh, solitary confinement, but or actually the dog of Iraqi one as well. Um, actually Fallujah as well, yeah. They're all okay. pretty horrific. They're all They're pretty all pretty horrific. horrific. Um, <laughs> but so we'd spend a while thinking of those and try to just draw parallels and figure out what we could do. And then maybe uh, that would occupy about one day because these are actually pretty simple uh, projects and it's not very hard to come up with ideas around them. And then the second day we could think about how to spin that into an actual campaign uh, where in what kind of action we'd ask people to take, um, start imagining the campaign website and all that. That might be the second day. The third day, probably have to start folding hexaflexograms. Yeah. Um, so that's our plan. Yeah. <laughs> So I also have to set up my uh, fear out. I need to get up to the to the uh, slide projector here. We'll be on this one. Give us one second. The next person we're going to talk to uh, is Dan Tagi, who we're going to call him actually in New Orleans. Okay, so. So this is Dan. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm good. So we're we're having this conference here talking about solitary, and I was just mentioning to them that you yourself. Not a solitary experience, but you did have an experience of being rested from the middle of your life. We're looking at the picture of you uh, uh, looking at us in your black t-shirt with your, your tattoos, right? It was uh, right after I got rescued by some uh, firefighters from Houston off of a rooftop. That's you being rescued. And that then, was, yeah, that was the, uh, the rescue boat there. And then here I have you in, in yellow. In the next oh, yeah. That was, um, this was about four days earlier. I was getting, uh, I was riding around in this big canoe getting provisions and people wanted the same stuff everywhere, almost unanimously, wine and toilet paper. <laughs> wine and toilet paper, there's the name of it. Only in New Orleans, yeah. <laughs> but, but eventually, and I'm going to go through fairly quickly some of the slides before we get to, to the money shot, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, but, but eventually, you, did you move from, uh, to a room or what happened next? 
Um, I was uh, I got sent to a Red Cross in Texas, and uh, I didn't have any bank accounts that would work because there were I had local banks, so I couldn't I had access to really nothing. And uh, I used the money to go to New York, and I stayed in, in a uh, Radisson hotel in J- at the, the airport Radisson at JFK, which was which was termed the uh, refugee hotel. And, and so in the refugee hotel, you became an artist again. And I'm just going to start showing some of the kinds of things you were doing, having ta- been stripped of all your previous kinds of tools. Here's, here's yeah. the, the wave. Yeah, this one is cut from loose leaf after hook a size great wave. Yeah. And then the skull? And, uh, using whatever materials I had at hand. The, neck, the skull is made from the, uh, I took some pages from the Gideon Bible about the, about the great flood and made the skull out of it and used some... Um, <laughs> Correction fluid for I got from the receptionist desk to make that kind of texture where I wetted out the rest of the words. And so the composition in the in the uh, in the in the spell. I wonder if they have Gideon's Bibles in in solitary. We can ask uh, later on. But uh, <laughs> here comes a very strange picture. Tell us what this is. Oh, this one is. Uh, I actually took a photograph of myself, and uh, I cut out the eyes and the nose and the mouth and glued them to my throat. So the top of my head there is, is actually the back of my. <laughs> um, you're, get, you're getting yeah, a large it's, oh. It's like a, uh, I don't know, like kind of a. <laughs> so here, just continuing on rather quickly though, we, uh, the, 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 what is this thing woven here? This is um, this is about eighteen um, playing cards, poker cards um, that I had found uh, in the lobby there. And there's a there's a um, saying on the bottom that says there's a tie that binds us to our homes, and uh, which seemed pretty appropriate as the chain is binding to their homes. And there's a bone in between that neither one of them can get. So the kind of security of home, but also the, the uh, how it should also be a in a time like this. All, all made out of playing cards. And then next, yeah. the, the, your superheroes. Um, that was uh, from some magazines, uh, comic books I got from a uh, from a uh, just a store, and uh, I, I cut out all the heroes. It was called all my all my heroes are super. Kind of the idea, like if there was some kind of mystical hero that could save the day, it would be. A good time for that. <laughs> Next, we have from an atlas, I guess. What happened? Um, this was kind of like a, a map, like to get at an educator store for a high school classroom, and I, I cut all the states out. It's called One Nation Underwater. Kind of how it affected the entire country, not just you know. I don't think it was so isolated to New Orleans. I think it seemed that it played out pretty nationally, and there was a lot of compassion there. You got these planes. Uh, these are all two-inch uh, die-cast bombers of, um, of planes that flew missions over um, the Middle East since 1971. It's led by uh, God Bless America in the front there. And I, I put them in this kind of um, migrating pattern. And we have, this looks like a Mondrian. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I reversed the, uh, the uh, white for black. It's called Night Boogie. Um, <laughs> being in, the, in New York, uh, I... I Got an appreciation for his Broadway book, you can really see it. It's pretty great. This is made from Legos. This is made from Legos? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to run ahead, actually, because I want to get to the money. We, uh, so I'm going to go a few, through a few things quickly. But then suddenly we get to this is the first of the money pieces. And some of you may recognize this from the New Yorker money issue. But, but this, thing, this one here says State of Fear. Mm-hmm. Tell, it just struck me that. If all you had in prison, in solitary, was a dollar bill, you could begin to do some interesting things. How did this happen? Um, well, if I had money in solitary, I'd probably be really popular when I got out of solitary, I would imagine. Uh, the state of fear just uh, comes about just the way I think uh, money is just spent uh, on, on, on this kind of idea of fear, of, of you know, economic fear, of terror fear, um, that I think it... It uh, drums a lot of money, and, and, and it gets funneled into wars and people. And, and during disasters, it seems to be um, you get put on the back burner. I mean, I had friends in Rockaway who got trumped by the election that were spending billions of dollars on an election, and, uh, you know, they had four feet of water in their houses. But this is made out of a single bill, the state of fear? This is a single bill, yeah. yeah. And the next one? The end is near, <laughs> I, uh, so I follow them to find the words, uh, you know, the phrases I need to have, and also uh, I make some aesthetic decisions. Like I like two eyes kind of peering out, the all-seeing eye, and then Washington's eye also looking at you. And then we got the next one. Oh, the heat is on. <laughs> um, 
I like this idea of, 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 you know, things building up, and the heat is on really came about right as this kind of uh, housing bubble was about to explode. And uh, just knowing that this impending uh, recession was coming, I made a huge the same? Are these all $1 bills, or do you have a different rule for different kinds of bills? Um, these are all single so far, all single bills. So um, if, if you had a single, how long does it take you to come up with one of these? One of these? Um, well, some some come pretty quickly, and uh, some take quite a long time. Here's, here's and, the next you know, one. I'm looking at the next one right now, the American Idol. Uh, I, this one was yeah, this one was great. Well, you know, money is the <laughs> is the idol, and I I, made, I sold it so Washington is kind of Kilroy symbol on the bottom. Um, so yeah, I like to get a lot of aesthetic aesthetic quality out of it. I mean, I wanted to seem like it was a crumpled bill, but at the same time, there's, you know, there's an aesthetic decision going on along with trying to find the words as well. Here comes the next one. Trust no one. Trust no one. <laughs> well, that one is kind of, you know, self-explanatory. <laughs> Maybe not a great rule to live by, but, you know, some skepticism is always uh, necessary, I think. And... Uh, live free or die. This one is uh, is the first where I really use multiple bills. This is four bills here. Ah, so you, so you have to be richer to be able to live free or die. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I sold a few trust no ones, so I was able to make a bigger bill. Yeah. Yeah. So how many bills does it take to make a revolution? Uh, revolution is three bills. Three. We need a revolution, and we can have it for three bills, folks. It, the revolution is, is cheaper than, than, uh, than living free, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the lesson we learned from that. Uh, yeah. Are they, they all $1 really bills? I with Occupy uh, Wall Street. I actually had I'd seen someone on, on a, uh, someone sent me a picture that uh, had my, this bill. Someone had got off the Internet and made a sign out of it. And and these are all one dollar bills though. So three one dollar bills or what? Or do you? Start? Oh no, this one is a, this one is a one, a fifty, and a twenty. Uh, revolution is really expensive. Really, yeah, yeah. It's revolution. really something that only the one only the one percent can do it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a one percent revolution. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and that now we have what is this next one? It, it don't tread on me. <laughs> so this one is kind of playing on on these kind of iconic phrases of uh, of Americana and and of course associating with everything to money. Yeah. So it's easier to not get tread on when you have a lot of money, especially yeah. in, in the prison system. More money uh, gets you further, for sure. I've gone on to the next one. Um, this is the kids are all right, so I'm starting to look a little bit more optimistic here, even though education cuts are, are devastating, me, especially in, uh, in Louisiana and, and federally. Um, hopefully that can turn around you know, now that um, Big Bird has a job again. You, you were saying you want to end up on a, on a, on a optimistic tone, but the next one is... Um, resistance is futile. <laughs> so this kind of contradicts the whole revolution. Um, so, I mean, yes, I was able to get a little bit sci-fi with this one, but I think the image is better than the phraseology is, is uh, pretty right on with politics. Right. So let's see here. This is the very last one here. And this is the newest one, the almighty dollar. Actually, this one is uh, really, really new. How long? But seriously, it's if you... one dollar bill. Just... Uh, Thank you for all that, but but if you were, if you had a few dollars in solitary, could you imagine entertaining yourself for a while with this, or would you get, would it get um, tiresome? I, well, I've been entertaining myself since about two thousand and seven, so. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> so maybe, maybe yeah. you have to be a certain kind of artist to be able to uh, to. But it would imagine. To see Mike is a little different. Um, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, listen, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate this 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 nomination of something one could do, and and good luck down there. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. So now we have another artist uh, with another sort of uh, possible intervention, uh, and this is Samantha Holmes. Is this your? Is this yours? No. This is mine. Okay. So. Oh, I am attached yeah, to you. Oh, I'm making it worse. But. <laughs> Samantha <laughs> Holmes is a, as you will see, a remarkable mosaicist. Uh, she'll talk to us a bit about that. Uh, yes. Um, when Ren called me a couple of weeks ago to ask what I would do if I were in solitary confinement. Uh, the answer was pretty clear. I was actually staying in an old military prison at the time in the countryside of Russia. 
uh, recently converted into a mosaic studio by the Ismail Akhmadov Foundation. I was working 12, 14, 16 hour days, barely interacting with others, uh, finishing up my work for a group show to be held in Moscow a few weeks later. Mosaic is uh, above all a solitary practice. The technique is slow and intensive. Each tile is cut and placed by hand. This is part of why you don't see much mosaic being done today in a world where everything is expected to happen so quickly. When you're working on a mosaic, time goes by in a very different way, measured in inches, not in hours. At times, you forget to eat, to socialize. In this, perhaps, it might be well suited to solitary confinement. It's as much a meditation as an art form. The process of laying the tiles is one of careful consideration, not only of placement, but size, particular shape, inclination, how it will catch the light, how close it lays to those beside it. You develop a relationship with each material. Every marble, stone, or glass has its own particular properties, color, durability, reflection of light. You form a relationship with them. You know their inconsistencies. You know their touch. The materials and te techniques that we use today are the same as those that we've been using for centuries, making the history of the medium all the more relevant. It's the medium of Greek mythology and Byzantine spirituality. In the 20th century, it's picked up by Italian fascism and Soviet communism. It's uncanny the formal and technical similarities that we can trace across the centuries. Ancient Roman chariots and fascist tanks. The Christian church and the American capitalists. What connects these works is not the content of their message, but the strength of the ideologies that they represent. Mosaic is the medium of empires. This last one is a mosaic I was studying just this week, actually, at Rockefeller Center. Uh, to date, I found more than 100 mosaics built in New York at the start of the 20th century, just at the time of the city's great capitalist boom. Again, mosaic comes in when ideologies coalesce. So why does this happen? Uh, part of it is the nature of the material itself, glass, stone, and marble that convey, above all, a sense of permanence. Um, Vasari, in his Lives of the Artists, refers to mosaic as painting for eternity, a concept that is immediately picked up by the Vatican, who to this day employs a team of mosaicists to recreate its paintings in glass and stone. In this way, mosaic becomes a material metaphor for permanence, for time, both in an earthly sense, attesting to the assumed longevity of the depicted subject, and in a spiritual one, by creating a parallel with the immortal paradise promised by the great religions. Now this kind of permanence, this kind of faith, isn't what I'm trying to capture in my work. It's actually quite the opposite. In the last century, Western societies, and in particular urban societies like ours, have turned away from belief in something larger than ourselves. The old empires have fallen. Religion no longer seems to provide us with clear answers to our questions about life, death, justice. But we still have those questions. My work uses the technical and conceptual framework of mosaic to address the ambiguities of contemporary society. I want to talk about dissolution rather than permanence. I want to talk about uncertainty and desire and doubt all within the context of those old belief systems. So back to the piece that I was creating in the Russian prison. This piece, uh, installed three weeks ago in Moscow, is the first in a series of site-specific works called the Absence Project. Positioned within the arch of a worn building structure, two lines of tesserae trace the outline of a central figure that is left unfilled, a void through which one sees the wall behind. Both our instincts and our memories of other similar images, again, that context of mosaic, tell us that there should be a figure there. This space, not nothing, but a delineated absence, is meant to evoke a sensation of emptiness and of loss. We feel an instinctual desire to fill that space without any clear sign as to how we might do so today. 
Context is everything in this work. The piece is installed in the bricked up doorway of an old factory in the heart of Moscow. The building complex, recently converted into the Art Play Design Center, site of last year's Moscow Biennale, shows the traces of its physical history. Scraped walls, old bricks, dangling wires that attest to the lives passed within its walls. The sense of permanence invoked by the mosaic lies in direct contrast to this deterioration, underlining the gap between the ideal world promised by the church and by the medium, in which there is justice, reason, immortality, and that in which we find ourselves complicated, painful, ultimately given to decline. The building acts as a frame to the mosaic, which in turn frames the wall within the figure, suggesting that in place of the saints, we might learn to hallow this other broken surface, the world as we really know it. This project takes on additional meaning in relation to each context. In Ravenna, Italy, home to the greatest surviving Byzantine mosaics, and incidentally, my home for a good part of each year, the figure's absence might refer to both the loss of individual faith and a sort of collective nostalgia for the city's cultural and historical past. In New York, it might express the last longings of a city in which everything is possible, but nothing is sacred. In prison, I think this project would give me the space to ask questions about the enormous gap between the inadequacy of our current justice system and that promise of biblical judgment that would offer each of us exactly the punishment or rewards appropriate to his life. I think probably there's some solace to be found in believing in that latter, some kind of hope in its very possibility. But there would also be the reality of the life that I was living, my solitude, my doubt, I would hope, my innocence. In that sense, and again, in the very slowness of the process of making, the work would become a tool for private meditation, both in the act of its creation and in its subsequent existence in the cell. The tools for mosaic are relatively simple, a hammer and chisel, a bit of cement, stone, essentially the same tools that chain gangs have been using for centuries. But I don't know that prison guards would really let me have a hammer and chisel in solitary. For me, mosaic doesn't have to be limited to traditional materials. It's a set of conceptual implications. It can pre be created from found materials, metal, rubber, bits of cement. It can be wood and carbon or paper. What's central to the medium is the patience that it requires, the ritual slowness of the process, and the devotion necessary to lend repeated action a larger purpose. This is a piece called Novena, also produced in Moscow, named for a nine-day prayer of petition to the Virgin Mary. In this work, a single sheet of paper is folded in upon itself and bound with wire in a moment of private meditation. The intended devotion is not written, but contained in the motions, the traces of the act itself. The papers are assembled into nine columns, whose length depends on the dedication of which I was capable in a given day, about two and a half meters at its longest. This piece was quite challenging for me personally. I'm not very religious, and this work was an attempt to confront the possibilities of that faith, but the consolation it may offer and the doubts that linger in myself. The whiteness of the paper represents both the purity of the intended prayer, should there be someone, something that listens, and the possibility of their emptiness, if there is not. In mosaic, this emptiness matters as much as the material itself in defining an image. We create lines with the spaces between the tesserae. Perhaps it is this aspect, above all, that might offer us a metaphor for the world today, focusing not on our ideologies, but on the spaces between them. Thanks. Just, just before you go down, I was just going to say, could you imagine? I'm not going to get my thing. Where am I? I was thinking, could you imagine doing this with chewing gum and chewing gum wrapper, for example? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the the nice thing about mosaic is, is it really is a a kind of paradigm for thought and, and for examination of a material. So what that material is doesn't matter so much as how you look at it, how you use it, uh, 
and essentially how you put it together. So anything that can be scaled and multiplied can, can make a mosaic. And now that I asked you the question, do you think... Do you want that? You, no, no, no. <laughs> do you think you'd be any good at this? Do you think you could survive? Do you think this would be a way of, um, of, of doing time, as has been said? I think it would keep me busy for quite some time. I think the realities, obviously, of solitary are more, are more complicated. But what it does give you is a way to uh, have a dialogue and have a relationship with a material that I think can give you back some of what's missing in the relationship you would have with another person. Thank you so much. Thanks, oh. The the last of the people I the last of the people I asked uh, when I was putting this together was Mike Daisy, uh, who, as you know, and who you, as you'll see in a second, is one of our great monologists. Oh. <laughs> and I specifically the question I asked him is whether uh, what it would be like for a monologist to be in solitary. And uh, so here is Mike Daisy, perhaps with an answer. Good afternoon. Um, I, I found this a very intriguing question, the question of what would happen in solitary. And it's been really interesting. I've been here for pretty much all of the day listening to people's sort of hypothetical constructions of what, what they might do. And what interests me is um, we, it's a rigged game, which is great because there's lots of rigged games in the world, so it's always instructive to engage in one wholeheartedly. It's a rigged game, we all know that, we all know how this is going to go because it was outlined in the program, because we all have a sense of what is to come. But the people who follow me are gonna have a much more intimate sense of what it actually means to be solitary. So in a sense, this is all pointless, but that actually makes it a very effective way of simulating being in solitary, I would think, because the feeling of hopelessness, the knowledge that what you are doing is pointless is actually implicit in everything that's happening, right? So. What fascinates me is, I, so I watch the day and I work extemporaneously, so I had a rough idea of what I thought I might talk about, but I didn't really. I was mostly sort of tabula rasa. And I was watching people um, talk, and you know, a large number of the people who are very uh, sharp, smart, um, uh, learned, excellent people, I'm sure, but their systems and methodologies are often built around suppositions that are, frankly, crazy because we're not going to have anything, you're not going to have anything outside yourself. We're not going to have any of these uh, devices. Like we don't even know if we'll have a dollar bill or a bit of chewing gum. We can hope, but making a plan now for what we'll do if we should be so lucky is to have a dollar bill and a bit of chewing gum. I mean, this is a future where those things will be like what is devoutly to be wished that we had those fucking things. More likely is we will not have those things. Uh, we'll have the things we didn't expect, like a jailer who interrupts solitary to kick you in the head or or, uh, your fecal matter. You'll have things like that is what we'll have if we're lucky. They may even take the fecal matter away from us immediately. I don't even know yet. I'm going to find out in a little while, just like the rest of you. So one of the things that's clarifying for me is that I am able, um, because of the terms of this question, I'm able to unbind myself to some degree, insofar as any of us can, from ego. Because I'm a monologist and I work extemporaneously. I work exactly as you are hearing me work right now. I speak with and connect with audiences. I try to gather them together even when the lighting is shitty and the room is ooh. I try to gather the energy together and talk about what's going on. That's an anthropological process that requires by its nature other people. It's not just not possible in solitary. It literally does not exist. I don't rehearse it. There is nothing. There's no there there, which in a sense frees me to actually wrestle with the core of the problem. Like, what would I actually do? I have the tools for this useless art form. And I think most of the artists and other thinkers today will be in a similar position where the tools would seem to be useful, but then prove to be pointless. And what do you do walking into that situation? I grew up in far northern Maine, and I was a, a lonely misanthropic child. And I was a misanthrope because I was essentially a hateful child. I was one of those uh, children who, um, I, I was like a little Andy Rooney. You know, I just was very, 
I just did not like other people. I complained constantly about the nature of things. And from a very young age, like we're talking third, fourth grade, at a time when more normal children are cavorting and I, I don't know what they're doing because I wasn't looking at them because I was, um, I, I, I was this very inward looking misanthrope. And um, in Northern Maine, a very cold and desolate place, the kind of environment where it is winter 11 months of the year and then one month is fly season. <laughs> in that environment, um, my, uh, my mother, I remember this so vividly, my mother would tell me to go outside and she'd be like, to play. And she'd make me go out and play. And of course, we lived in this remote rural area, so there were no neighbors, you know, and it'd be like three or four miles one way, the next house. So you just go out and just sort of sit in a snowbank in the great <laughs> Bekettian whiteness all around you, the complete absence, and just wait for the time to pass when you'd be allowed to go back inside. Um, and so I think a large amount of why I'm a storyteller now is because, uh, I'm, I'm, because I'm fundamentally, uh, you know, spiritually deformed in this way. Like fundamentally that period of my life l uh, caused me from an early age to really enshrine the idea, not just of telling stories, but of crafting entire universes in my mind. Like I would spend an inordinate amount of time, and by inordinate I mean all of it. I would spend all of my time <laughs> building complex, fantastical structures, often that were um, pulled completely from fantasy and they would be, you know, wild imaginings of pulp science and fiction, incredibly derivative at times and other times shockingly original. Now that I look back on them, they'd be sitting right side by side. So I had no um, qualms because I was so young. I had not developed taste yet, that terrible affliction that hurts every artist. I didn't have taste yet. And so I was perfectly happy to have um, 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 my own version of, of, of Jedi before uh, George Lucas came back and ruined them for everyone. My own version of what those early movies might have looked like in my own made up mind sitting side by side with a world filled with people who have no faces, who wear these masks. I remember this so vividly. They have a series of masks, and each mask is an expression, and they carry them with them in packs on their back when they march up through the woods. And those fantasies would sit right next to each other, even though one is arguably, oh, that's somewhat interesting. Let's talk about that and what it means about you and your psychology. And the other is just a derivative of a movie that had influenced me very deeply, but I didn't make any distinctions between them because the um, imagination, when it's hungry, feeds on everything that's around it. So I was an unhappy child and uh, fundamentally an imaginative child feeling he was trapped in this bubble universe. And um, I also, at a young age, younger than this, was a weird child. Like I was very clearly one of those children that you would drown. Like in another age, we would drown this child, you know? Um, and we don't do that anymore. And sometimes I think, it worked out for me, but I don't know fundamentally. Maybe we should still be drowning people like this. Like maybe there's a reason we feel that compulsion where we want to kill them, except apparently for our parents who feel like they want to love the child, no matter how misanthropic it is. Or, or so I'm assured, although some of you here are probably parents and probably secretly would assure me that you too wanted to drown your child. You're just not allowed to speak of it. But as a young, young child, I didn't speak. I didn't speak for a really long time. Um, I'm not good with childhood development, like I'm not good at remembering what the correct age it is to speak, but I was well beyond that. And in fact, to the point where, you know, my mother, who's really not uh, book learned in any way, even she was like, he should be talking by now. And I was, I was the oldest, so I was the first one that you make all the mistakes with. So they had no guideline to go by, and they, they took me in to see, you know, if uh, I was mentally defective in some way. And... Um, no one could figure anything out, and I didn't seem to be uh, defective. I just simply wasn't talking. And then when I did speak, when I did finally start talking, I'm told that I began speaking in, in complete sentences. And, and now, obviously, that disease has gotten worse, and I speak in complete paragraphs. But you, you understand what I'm saying. And then as I grew, I was always this large, strange-looking creature, um, uh, large, round, and um, uh, uh, um, especially in high school, in early college, I had a huge number of physical traits that were outside the norm. I um, engaged in an inordinate amount 
of physical repetitive motion. Like this thing I'm doing right now with my right hand, I can do this for hours. And I find it really soothing. Like, I really enjoy the feeling of each pad of the finger coming down on my thumb, and I can feel the difference between one finger and the other finger, and the rhythm, and if it changes, I can feel that, and I, I, I enjoy it in a way that is entirely pre-verbal. That is not built out of words. You know, words, those pathetic betrayers, which, if you are in a cell, are worthless. There's no point to your words. You cannot write them down. And there is no one to communicate with. The universe has shrunk down to this box. There's nowhere for the words to go. The words are an illusion, like they always fucking were. You're not actually going to be able to speak to anyone. You're not actually going to be able to get a word out. And there is no one to speak with because you are there. <laughs> you are the generator of the words. If there is no one to speak to, if there is no audience, there is no point to speaking. So, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't be speaking. I would be doing this a lot. I'd be patting my arm in this particular way. When I was young, I used to do this a lot. A lot. Oh my God, it's still so soothing. Like when I do it now, I trained myself out of my freshman year of college because uh, someone who's now a professor of theater at, a, at a, another college told me on first meeting me, he met me in, um, in theater class and I was sitting in the corner. And remember, I'm a large man, right? So we have certain stereotypes about that. I have a large man, I'm sitting on the floor of the theater lab. I'm rocking back and forth as I was prone to do. Like I rock uncontrollably if I'm not thinking about it. And I have a pencil in my hand and I'm flicking it back and forth in my left hand and I'm doing this. <laughs> it's theater, so perhaps I am exaggerating slightly the scale, but I swear to you, I think I am only exaggerating slightly. It was really extreme, like how much, because the, the pleasure of it is so internal that it's, it's um, well, it's better than masturbating, frankly, and you can do it in public, and people, for a while, don't tell you to stop. <laughs> and that's sort of the problem, is because there's no social stigma directly against it. And my friend let me know that he thought, he thought he was like, oh, it's a room full of people, and this is like maybe a, a mentally challenged person who's been invited to sit in, or maybe, maybe we're going to be studying him to emulate him in exercises later. What I'm saying is, if I was younger, if I'd been born in a different age, an age we live in now, I don't really fully doubt that I would have been medicated. I would have been medicated at an early age because I think when I read articles based on knowing very little, but based on what I see, I think I would fall somewhere on what they call that, that spectrum of autism. I think I would fall somewhere on that spectrum and I think I would be medicated to remove these symptoms, but I would not have any such medication in solitary. And that's a gift because those movements, those physical parts of me, that body is the only thing I can be assured is coming into the room with me. My words are not coming because there's no one to speak to. My mind is coming, but purely as meat baggage in my skull. But my body is physically there. The physical kinesthetic sensations are physically there. I am physically present. And so the truth is, in that room, my art would avail me nothing, and I would probably engage in elaborate fantasies that are pre-verbal, even more primitive over time than the ones I did as a child in those snowbanks, because that was a different world. I could turn my head and see different things in every direction. This would be a smaller world, and in that smaller world, I would move again and again and again, and that would soothe me and I would craft my own door. You know, um, Ursula Le Guin, who I think is one of the really important uh, writers, especially uh, in fantasy over the last 50 or 60 years, she wrote this trilogy of books, this Earthsea trilogy, about a world full of wizards and princes and such. It's also an elaborate metaphor, the books, and in the third book, a crack, people open a crack in the world and all the magic of the world starts pouring out. And the deal is that it's the people who practice the magic itself, the wizards, sort of that world's equivalent of the writers and thinkers and the kind of people who've been speaking today, including myself, make a deal with that crack. And the deal is they give up their magic, but in return, they can live forever. And if they are allowed to do that, then they can stay in this world forever. 
because on the other side of that crack is death. And in return for immortality, they give up all their gifts and what they do not understand and come to accept through the course of the book is that the crack is a delusion because the ability to live forever is unnatural. To stay in the world is a terrible mistake we have to pass on. And on the other side of the crack is death. But the only way to pass into death is to give up yourself entirely. And for me, that is what would happen in um, solitary. I would cease. I would cease because I would have to let go of the ego attachment to the idea that I know who I am. I would never come out the same person. I don't know that anyone here would. And it's a very Western but understandable idea that we can cling to who we are, that we know ourselves so well, that we're the same person we were yesterday and yesterday and yesterday. But it is not true. We've already heard how memory shifts and bends. We already know that everything we make is reconstructions. We reforge the story of our lives over and over again. I would have to let go of that. I would sit in the room and I would rock and I would touch my arms. I would stroke my hair. I would wait until time itself had passed away. And when it was over, if indeed it ever was over, someone else would walk out of that room. Thank you. You want to talk or we all stand hug. Oh. <laughs> I think actually uh, we could talk, but I think I, I, there's no way to top that. So, so what I think I will do, suggest instead, is that we'll take a 15-minute break. And when we come back, we're going to hear from people who actually have spent time, starting with Brayton, Brayton Buck. So thank you so much, Mike. That thank was fantastic. Thank you. Oh, sure.